there and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where every season has a theme. Wherein that theme you will find six movies, and each of those movies are selected one by one and featured in its very own episode where we provide a little history on the why, whens, where, whos, huhs, and reallys behind why the movie was made. Then, in exchange for nothing but your precious time here on Earth, we give you an entire end-to-end review of the movie with jokes and stupid voices and self-entitled opinions. It's a delight. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we have approached the halfway point of this season's theme. It's like Jaws, where we're taking on half a dozen movies that ripped off the original summer movie blockbuster, Jaws. And in this, episode three of the current season, we are featuring a movie with a deadly predator that doesn't come from the ocean, it comes from the skies. I'm speaking, of course, about the film, The Swarm. Technically, the movie isn't about one single deadly predator. It's a bunch of killer bees that all team up to form a swarm of bees, and then they go cause a whole bunch of trouble in a small town. It's like Jaws, but with a swarm of bees. Come to think of it, it's also a lot like Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, but with bees, and no metaphors on how babies get made. This episode features an actor long overdue for an appearance on Pick 6 Movies, Mr. Michael Caine. It may be his first appearance, but it shan't be his last. So what do you say we quit wasting time and get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to get this episode started? It's a beautiful day, the beaches are open, and you people are going to have a wonderful time. Pick six movies, as you know, means friendship. Farewell and adieu to you, fair Spanish maidens. Farewell and adieu to you, ladies of Spain. (laughs) This'll be fun. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the greatest cinematic spectacles the world has ever seen. Thrill to fiery infernos and chill to a family lost in the far reaches of space. This is a momentous occasion. Get ready for the tale of the master of disaster, the terror of television, a man who never saw a foot of stock footage he couldn't use. It's the one, the only, Irwin Allen. Wait, you don't know who Irwin Allen is? Why, he's only one of the most influential producers of the golden age of television. And not to mention, the guy credited with creating, or at least popularizing, the disaster film. There is a direct line between Irwin Allen and movies like Independence Day, or Man of Steel, or heck, Jaws. Like any good showman, Irwin Allen was all about spectacle. But with Mr. Allen, it was spectacle on a budget. Irwin Allen's parents migrated from Russia, and Irwin Allen grew up very poor in New York City as the son of Jewish immigrants. He had a flair for writing and pursued a career in journalism, which was sidelined by the Great Depression. His poor family was suddenly poorer, and that meant no school for Irwin. When he was 22, Allen decided to kick the dust of New York City off his heels and head west to Hollywood. He got his first break editing Key Magazine, one of many entries into the realm of Hollywood gossip and star obsession. In the first of what would be many such instances in his professional life, Irwin Allen saw the success of Key Magazine and thought, hey, I can do that. He started a Hollywood gossip column entitled Hollywood Merry-Go-Round. Notable for the inclusion of a merry-go-round, which I think has since been abolished for childhood safety reasons, and that Steve Allen was the announcer. Steve Allen would be the first host of The Tonight Show, which is the collection of YouTube videos Jimmy Fallon does now. Irwin Allen produced the television version of his syndicated column and was by all measures a success. This success opened the door at just the right time for Irwin Allen, who after 12 years of gossip-related tomfoolery, was ready to do something different. In the early days of Hollywood, films were made in the studio system. What that meant was that studios would put directors and actors under contract as exclusive agents of their company. If MGM owned your contract, you couldn't go across the street to make a picture for 20th Century Fox without MGM getting its beak wet too. 
Also, the studios would arrange for public relationships between their stars and often treated the women under contract like indentured servants. It was all incredibly secretive and gross. And if you need another podcast in your life, you should check out You Must Remember This, a terrific collection of well-researched seasons about the golden age of Hollywood and how god-awful it really was. But trust me when I say, it was pretty rotten. The movie studio United Artists was actually a response to this system, a studio made up of talent instead of the suits so they didn't have to live under these egregiously invasive contracts. By the time Irwin Allen was flexing his showbiz muscles in the early 50s, the studio system was collapsing on account of it being terrible and a lot of performers not standing for it. But nature abhors a vacuum, and so the studio system was replaced with the agency system. Instead of contracts with studios, actors and directors and writers would align themselves with talent agents who would package movies as one big pile of movie. Let's say I have Waldo Salt for my writer, Bogey is between pictures, and this gal with two stories of legs, Lauren Bacall, just signed on too. I'll take all of that to Warner Brothers and sell it to them for one lump sum. It wasn't the artist-controlled future Charlie Chaplin and his pals might have envisioned when they began United Artists, but it was better than the draconian rule of the studios. And up until the blockbusters and streaming services upended the film industry, it's how making movies was done for decades. Irwin Allen read the tea leaves on this and positioned himself as a talent agent, which lasted only as long as it took Irwin Allen to see the nuts and bolts of film production, and he thought, hey, I can do that. He struck a deal with RKO, the company behind famous films like the original King Kong, a story you can hear more about in Season 8, Episode 1 of this very program. Allen would produce three films for RKO, the first called Where Danger Lives with Robert Mitchum. Following that, he produced Double Dynamite and A Girl in Every Port, these last two with the estimable Groucho Marx, but pretty lame films overall. And then Irwin Allen decided that in addition to producing, he wanted to direct. And with RKO behind him, Irwin Allen dove into a cinematic adaptation of The Sea Around Us. That book was written by Rachel Carson, one of the great marine scientists of the 20th century. Her books Under the Sea Wind, The Sea Around Us, and The Edge of the Sea are critical works of nonfiction that help not only in our understanding of the world beneath the waves, but Carson's poetic writing made it feel like it was part of us. The Sea Around Us won the 1952 National Book Award for Nonfiction and a Burroughs Medal in Nature Writing. It launched Carson as one of America's great conservationists, and who better to tell that tale than former gossip columnist Irwin Allen? The movie was a documentary, of course, made up largely of stock footage. Allen had a penchant for the sensational, and his film featured such horrors of the sea as whalers eviscerating a whale before your very eyes. Esteemed naturalist Rachel Carsons was so horrified by the resulting film, she swore never to sell the rights to her books again and did not. Erwin Allen's rather tasteless take on the book was awarded the Oscar for Best Documentary Film, making Erwin Allen now Oscar winner Erwin Allen. He followed the success of The Sea Around Us with a turn as producer for Dangerous Mission, a movie most interesting for being in 3D and starring Vincent Price in a relatively early role alongside Piper Laurie. But Allen wanted to stay in the director's chair, so he moved his tent from RKO to Warner Brothers and struck up a deal to direct another documentary, this one about the evolution of life on planet Earth called The Animal World. It included such evolutionary milestones as dinosaurs fighting, an effect courtesy of Ray Harryhausen himself, and lots more stock footage of other animals. It was so accurate, in fact, Allen was asked to tone down the gore in his documentary. The, quote, movie, unquote, was followed up a year later in 1957 with The Story of Mankind. Please believe me when I say that all of the following happens in that movie. Because scientists develop something called a super H-bomb, 
an intergalactic court is summoned to hear the case of whether humanity should be exterminated on account of all the super H bombs and being terrible to each other and whatnot. The prosecutor is the devil, played by Vincent Price. And then there's the Marx Brothers cameo and Peter Lorre as Emperor Nero, or maybe Dennis Hopper as Napoleon is more your speed. Either way, this is a Bill and Ted movie I really want to see. That's what I always thought the series was missing, stock footage. And after the story of mankind, Alan produced The Big Circus, a spectacle film about the circus, if you hadn't guessed by the title. And then Irwin Allen moved his shingle to 20th Century Fox, where he would really make his name. He started with a trio of films that all fall into the special effects spectacle film. Yep, they existed even in the early 1960s, it's just that the special effects weren't all that special. For example, the first of Alan's pictures at Fox was The Lost World, an adaptation of the Arthur Conan Doyle classic. To save some effects budget and shooting time, Alan plastered some fins on alligators and big lizards, and bada bing bada boom, you got yourself some dinosaurs. It was, despite being cheap by even the standards of the day, a modest hit for both Irwin Allen and 20th Century Fox. The next movie was a fantasy sci-fi epic, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, where another team of scientists rushed to save the world from Van Allen Belt radiation. Notable for being an early vehicle for Barbara Eden, aka Genie from I Dream of Genie, an incredibly creepy television program by today's standards. They wouldn't let Barbara Eden show her navel, but it was okay to be an owned magical slave? Whatever you say, previous decades. Anyways, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea was a big, big hit, and it looked like Alan was on his way up. And then he produced Five Weeks in a Balloon, which is just what the title suggests, and was not very good, or popular. And the winds at 20th Century Fox were shifting, too. In 1963, 20th Century Fox released Cleopatra, a famously expensive movie in one of the first and biggest cinematic flops. It tanked so bad, Fox was looking to stave off the bleeding in its film division by getting some life in television. Allen said, hey, I can do that, and he produced a string of genre series for 20th Century Fox beginning with Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Yep, the TV version of the movie Allen produced. It was a hit and it looked great on television because Irwin Allen recycled all the sets from the movie. Oh, and there was some stock footage. Always with the stock footage, this guy. While Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea was scoring, Allen produced a series envisioned as Swiss Family Robinson in Space. Lost in Space premiered in 1965 and was reasonably successful for a couple of seasons, but it has gone on to be a sci-fi staple and cult favorite, thanks in large part to the performance of Jonathan Harris as the evil Dr. Smith, who would often scheme to sell the family's kid into slavery to some alien race in the first part of the episode, only to be shamed and forgiven by the end. Following Lost in Space was Time Tunnel, which showcased Alan's gift for weaving in stock footage from films set in different historical eras to add some production value to his television show. Then there was Land of the Giants, the most expensive show he produced, but it only lasted a few seasons too. By the time the 70s rolled around, Alan was looking for a hit and not finding it. A show called City Beneath the Sea fizzled, despite its judicious reuse of sets from previous Alan productions. He tried a few years before to put a three-movie deal together with Avco Embassy Pictures, but it fell apart. Alan did, however, hold out hope for one of those movies in that portfolio, an adaptation of a book by Paul Gallico called The Poseidon Adventure. It was the exciting tale of a luxury liner capsized by a freak wave and the struggles of the survivors to reach safety in the overturned ship. Fox was shy about going all in on the Poseidon Adventure's $10 million price tag, so Allen raised half the budget himself, with Fox footing the bill for the other half. Allen assembled an all-star cast, including Gene Hackman and Ernest Borgnine and Shelley Winters, all of them big stars of the day, and Irwin Allen directed the action scenes himself. When the Poseidon Adventure launched, it made over $100 million and assured Allen's future in producing films at Fox. 
he wanted to follow Poseidon up with another grand spectacle based on another novel, The Tower. This was another tale of large-scale misfortune, this time in a high-rise set of blades. Unfortunately, Warner Brothers owned the rights to that book, so Allen found a knockoff novel called The Glass Inferno and went about pre-production on that film at 20th Century Fox. In a rare move, rather than each studio making a competing Tower on Fire movie, Warner Brothers and Fox decided to play nice and co-produce the film, now called The Towering Inferno. It was another all-star cast, this time with the likes of Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. And it was almost three hours long, but still managed to make a ton of cash. And it won three Oscars! With a hot hand, Allen returned to television, lured by Fox with bigger budgets. There were three that went to pilot with the idea being, if the pilot movies are a hit, the show will go to series. But only Swiss Family Robinson ever made it to series, and that only lasted for 20 episodes before the plug was pulled on that. The problem Erwin Allen had was that the culture was changing right out from under the poor guy. In the mid-1970s, when Allen was in his early 60s, movies were changing forever. Easy Rider and Mean Streets and The Godfather and Star Wars and Jaws and The Conversation, movies that changed the landscape of how we considered film. These weren't just pieces of entertainment, they were emotionally sophisticated and made by filmmakers who wanted to challenge the form. And in the 1970s, they were met with audiences who rewarded that daring with box office success. Erwin Allen is remembered as being bewildered by the rise of Star Wars. I mean, there were no stars in that movie, no love story. In 20th Century Fox, the studio behind such films as Star Wars was rolling over its upper management to get with the times. And that meant that the slate of old school disaster movies Erwin Allen was known for were passe. Warner Brothers wasn't shy about being in the Erwin Allen business there. They built him a brand new office and Erwin Allen went back to Warner Brothers and set shop up there for a few years. His work at Warner Brothers is a rash of movies built around disasters or personalities, made for TV fare like Flood and Fire and Viva Knievel. He directed two movies for Warner Brothers, The Swarm, which we'll come back to in a second, and Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, neither of which were hits. He also produced When Time Ran Out in 1980, which is largely considered the death blow of the Allen-style disaster movies. It was another star-studded cast with Paul Newman, returning alongside Jacqueline Bissett and Burgess Meredith and Pat Morita. It's a volcanic eruption film with Newman as the hero trying to save lives before this volcano blows and covers everyone in fiery death. When it was released, one reviewer titled his take when ideas ran out, if that gives you any idea of the reception. Even Newman admitted he did the movie solely for the money, which would form the seeds of his Newman's own brand, so kind of a happy ending. The so-called Master of Disaster continued to work and produce until 1986, when failing health pushed him into retirement. He was still planning his next film at the age of 70, and we should all be so lucky. Allen died five years later in 1986, and left behind an enormous legacy of film and television. Remakes of Lost in Space and The Poseidon Adventure were launched, as well as a whole reboot of the Lost in Space series on Netflix a few years back. But enough about Irwin Allen himself, what about the subject of tonight's buzzworthy film, The Swarm? Well, for starters, The Swarm is a terrible movie. Really, really bad. This was another adaptation for Irwin Allen, who nabbed the rights from Arthur Herzog, Herzog was a horror novelist who specialized in animal run amok stories, so a personal favorite of mine. He is also responsible for the novel Orca, which does sound intriguing. The story was based around a very real thing. In the mid-1950s, breeders of bees mixed Brazilian honeybees with African bees to generate a hardier strain that could survive in tropical climates. As bees do, some of these swarms of bees flew the proverbial coop and spread northward from Brazil. And it is true that these bees were more aggressive, like their African ancestors, and would attack in swarms. Over the past 70-odd years since their creation, these bees have killed about a thousand people. 
But in the 1970s, the idea that Africanized bees, as they were called, were coming up from the southern border to invade the United States and, I don't know, steal our crops probably, well, that was the stuff of nightmares. I remember news stories from when I was a kid about the threat of Africanized bees running ramshackle over the southern United States. It was all bullshit, of course, a sensational story to capture viewers, but it fueled a bunch of these books and movies. The same year, in fact, as The Swarm, a TV movie called The Savage Bees hit the air and was probably a lot closer to The Swarm, both book and movie, than anyone cares to admit. It was also, I would argue, a better version of a killer bee movie in that no one is yelling, look out, the Africans are coming for us every five minutes. Yeah, it turns out there's some really unfortunate overtones to the swarm, but we're going to get into all that when chat arrives. Allen assembled an incredible cast, including Catherine Ross and Michael Caine and Henry Fonda and Richard Chamberlain and Olivia de Havilland, for heaven's sake. But no one seemed to think they were doing anything great here. Michael Caine agreed to the movie script unread thanks to the strength of the cast already signed on and the fact his mother needed a new house, and so he did the swarm. Fonda was a Hollywood legend, of course, and was an avid beekeeper in real life, which puts an interesting spin on son Peter Fonda's Yuli's Gold. You may also notice the presence of helicopters in the movie. Allen had an arrangement with the United States Air Force, and so the swarm is chock full of real shots of helicopters thanks to this arrangement. It is, in its way, the stock footage of the swarm. The movie was released and tanked hard. Critics drubbed it, and both actors and Irwin Allen himself were quick to distance themselves when the movie was released. Allen ultimately refused to ever speak publicly about the movie again, while Kane, as mentioned above, wasn't shy about his motives in doing the film for the press. He even joked that Henry Fonda was in it too, but Michael Caine was the one who got all the blame. Is The Swarm really that bad? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it really is. But we're going to have a wonderful time talking about how terrible it is when Chad gets in here to skewer The Swarm. Ladies and gentlemen, queens and drones, it's time to take wing with 1978's The Swarm. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to a brand spanking new episode of Pick 6 Movies. We are at uh, episode 3 of season 16, if you can believe that. And uh, I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a Ranstel. That voice you hear, as incredulous as I am, is one Chad Cooper. Uh, we have known each other since zygote age. And now we have assembled to uh, discuss movies based around the central theme. That, that's the idea of Pick 6 Movies. This season, of course, it's like Jaws. Mm -hmm. And this movie does Jaws one better by having a million little flying Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of one big swimming Jaws. You're right. That's what it is. What's on next week's episode of Pick 6 Movies? <laughs> oh, you're not getting off that easy. <laughs> Chad, this is a movie that is two and a half hours long. Bo, I have not seen a movie more in need of an editor than the swarm it is so unnecessarily bloated i like the series of shots that we will not talk about on this episode of just people getting out of cars and going into buildings and stopping to tie their shoe this movie never saw a helicopter it didn't want to take a, a very long shot of the digital version which i bought not rented on amazon prime had a minute and four seconds at the beginning of just just black nothing. Just a little quiet time to contemplate whether or not you really wanted to watch this movie, Bo. I've warned so many people, like, <laughs> listen to this episode when it comes out. Under no circumstances should you watch The Swarm. <laughs> I want to talk about three things that I really liked about this movie before we talk about the other 99% of this film that's just absolute trash. Okay. okay, right. Henry Fonda, sure. Number one, Jerry Goldsmith did the music for this movie and his musical score carries this film on its shoulders for two and a half very long hours. The music sets the tone for every scene in this film because the writing and the acting are so bland that without it you wouldn't know if a scene was supposed to be suspenseful or dramatic or supposedly tragic or sad but 
Every single scene in this movie is just bolstered by his musical score. I don't know that I would go that far, but go on. Look, Goldsmith did what? He did Chinatown. Yeah. He won an Oscar for The Omen, yeah. Alien First Blood, Gremlins, Poltergeist, Supergirl, Season 5, Episode 1 of Pick 6 Movies. Look, and I think we did a joke about Jerry Goldsmith in that episode where it was like, John Williams booked, get me Goldsmith. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is sort of kind of the height of Jerry Goldsmith's rise to power. Like, it's not far off of, you know, some really big scores. But the music in this movie really helps you understand the tone of every scene because nothing else does. And Michael Caine has two gears in this movie, which is pensive and shouting. And mm -hmm. there is no in between. <laughs> Or as I like to call it, the full Pacino. Give Michael Caine some credit. It was the full Caine before Pacino got that Oscar for Sin of a Woman and realized, <laughs> oh, I just have to yell at people and they'll give me Oscars? Done and done. <laughs> in addition to the music, I really enjoyed the practical effects in this movie. They look cheap by modern standards, yes, but I think that decades from now, people will look back on all of the noticeable green screen technology and lazy digital effects used on most made for streaming movies and they will enjoy them with the same type of nostalgia when technology surpasses current limitations of digital filmmaking yeah that's the problem with going with digital effects is that they're always going to get better and you're you're dating your film to some degree yeah i mean most of the practical effects i would argue are things like here's the model of a helicopter exploding and or this vacuum cleaner full of bees that we stuck on reverse but but there's a charm to what they're trying to pull off absolutely i far prefer some of the the crappy effects that we see in this movie to some of the crappy effects that you see like you said in most big movies these days look like total shit because <laughs> it's all digital backdrops and stuff let me check my list here real quick all right number one the music that was good number two practical effects we talked about that. And the third and final thing I enjoyed about this movie, Bo, was the gratuitous use of flamethrowers in Act 3. But yeah. much more on that later. They show up in Act 1, the first scene. They don't use them, though. No, but the, you have them. I mean, it's Chekhov's flamethrower at that point. <laughs> like, you know that that son of a bitch is going to go off, like, once upon a time in Hollywood at some point. Yeah, but not to the degree that they use flamethrowers. I've never seen a movie with this many flamethrowers going off at once. Yes, they wield them like handguns in this movie. Most people have a flamethrower in this film. <laughs> <laughs> which is not your your common walking around experience our movie opens up and we get Irwin allen's production of the swarm oh boy <laughs> the title is written in this font treatment that appears to be made out of bees collectively forming each letter and bo i really like that Irwin allen gave himself top billing kind of like dino de la rentes did in that 78 king kong remake which was featured in season eight episode one of pick six movies Irwin allen is nothing if not a pt barnum-esque kind of figure and so yes it, he is very very proud to come one come all look at this crazy ass b movie we're out at some missile site in the desert and a tank rolls up through this fenced perimeter and a bunch of men hop out dressed in orange and white hazmat suits with guns and flamethrowers yep guys in orange have the guns guys in white have the flamethrowers is the way that i peg this I was really confused as to who these men were because I couldn't tell if they were soldiers or hired goons or space travelers. They look like futuristic crossing guards with either safety orange or reflecting white suits. And I like that their helmets look like motorcycle helmets that are all color coordinated with shields that hide their faces. Yeah, you expect Hank Scorpio to be like, hey, Bradford Dillman, did you take a couple of these guys out on your way out? Hup, 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 hup. Yeah, it's very Bond villain flunky outfits. Two of them head over to this brown van and they open up the back to find nobody inside. And so all of these armed whatevers they are, they head down these stairs into a bunker with their guns and flamethrowers. Oh, so many flamethrowers at the ready. When they go down into this bunker, Bo, this is where you know you're in trouble because their entrance into this bunker takes forever everything is done very measured it's like a pt anderson movie only there's no point 
it's like that Johnny Depp movie, Nick of Time, where everything was shot in real time. Like one second of film is one second of time in these characters' lives. Yeah, except <laughs> this movie takes place over the course of about 96 <laughs> hours and you're going to feel every one of them. These orange and white goons, they wander down one hall, then another hall, then around a corner, then they go in the cafeteria and get a cup of coffee, talk about the game last night. They got lost at one point and had to check the map, and then they had to double back a little bit because they realized, <laughs> oh, we, we should have just stayed straight at the Orange Julius, and they didn't do that. All joking aside, Bo, there are no jokes in this movie whatsoever. There is zero levity to be found. I think there's like two actual jokes in the wild the kid with the sucker that there's the sunflower seed gag at the end that's That's not a joke it's look i'm grading (laughs) on a curve here there's a good richard widmark who's the the general in this movie we'll get to where he's like somebody tell that man to put his hands down like that's about as close as you get it's not funny at all this is the kind of movie that inspired the zucker brothers to make airplane it's so serious that you can't help but laugh at it or with it or beside it it's crazy chad that this movie came out in 1978 the fact that this movie is contemporary with something like star wars just blows your mind it is such an old school traditional hollywood kind of film which is you know cigar chomping let's get a bunch of actors who's a hot star what about that michael kane how about him and what about henry fonda we'll wheel him into the movie for a couple of minutes and i think jose ferrer owes me a favor if you're feeling frisky you should just pull the audio from the trailer where they list everyone who stars in this movie and interject it right here starring michael kane Catherine ross richard woodmark Richard Chamberlain, Olivia de Havilland, Ben Johnson, Lee Grant, Jose Ferrer, Patty Duke Aston, Slim Pickens, Bradford Dillman, Fred McMurray, and Henry Fonda. Wasn't that a delight? Yes. <laughs> so that's everybody in the movie, and that's the selling point. That is, it's just look at all these people. I showed this trailer to my son, who's 13. He said, Who the hell's not in this movie? I was like, I don't know, man. Everybody's in this film. And I was like, Also, I'm going to need to talk to your mom. She shouldn't be teaching you words like that. It's called a film, son. How do you know who Olivia de Havilland is? <laughs> and you know, to your point, this movie came out the same year as the original Superman, Bo. Yeah, that's and, crazy. And it, it came out when Piranha came out. It came out when Jaws 2 came out. And I swear, it feels like it's eight years earlier. It blows your mind that this movie was not made in 1971. <laughs> It just feels so out of touch and out of step with where movies were at the time. And it's, I mean, also just not very good, but just the whole tone of it feels very television, you know? And I think Erwin Allen, he's a television guy. So when you look at this movie and especially all these like command center sets and shit, it all just looks like slightly better lost in space sets. You know what movie also came out this year? Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. That is a better movie, an objectively better movie than this. We're going to agree to disagree. It's shorter. Yes, it's better because it's shorter. And there's no Earth, Wind, and Fire in the swarm. Right. <laughs> if Earth, Wind, and Fire showed up to fight the bees with flamethrowers in this, all of a sudden this movie is a contender for the greatest film of all time. <laughs> That's how on a razor's edge <laughs> entertainment is, Chad. After our cream sickle colored goons uh, make their way over to the elevator, someone taps the 18th floor and they go down into the belly of the earth where they stop at the command center and they wander around a little bit more, get lost, and eventually make their way inside to find a bunch of soldiers dead in a stereotypical supercomputer room from the late 70s. You got your standard white and red flashing lights on cabinets about eight feet tall. There's lots of magnetic tape reels spinning around bunch of monitors that aren't doing anything one screen is just flashing the word alert that's pretty helpful you'd think all the dead guys would have hipped them to that fact oh we ought to keep our our heads on a swivel there are dead people everywhere like on the floor in the chair one dead guy is somehow still standing up leaning against the wall i don't think that's how dead guys work as we'll hear on the tape later chad these bees can be pretty sneaky but then, though, we get a fantastic extension of armed goons just 
slowly wandering around the command center, just sort of looking around. Nobody's really talking. We're just sort of checking things out. Poking around, seeing what's what. Most importantly, nobody's shooting off a flamethrower. They're doing a little antiquing at the command center. Just, ooh, this is nice. Mm -hmm. Take a little break to meditate, write in their journal. You know, it's Mindfulness Monday, everyone. Let's everybody (laughs) sit down and write in our dream journals. One of these soldiers who is Major Baker. Bradford Dillman, speaking of Piranha, he's uh, in Piranha. Ah, I forgot about that. <laughs> but he, he's sort of a knockoff Charlton Heston. And, and when he pulls off this helmet and mask, he is one of the sweatiest individuals you're likely oh. to see in a movie. This is a sweaty movie, Bo. <laughs> oh boy, is it. It's not Cool Hand Luke or Key Largo, no, no, no. but there is sweat everywhere in this film. There's a really good Henry Fonda sweat at one point. Olivia de Havilland gets sweaty. She sure does. Oh my goodness. You're right. It's not quite Cool Hand Luke, but it's like Zandali sweaty. <laughs> yeah, kids look that movie up, but don't tell your parents you're looking it up. You know what I'm saying? It's Nicolas Cage getting down. <laughs> Major Baker takes off his helmet and he looks around for way too long. Then he calls topside where he reports back to General Slater, who's being flown around in this military helicopter. And Major Baker says, "Uh, everyone's dead, sir. They're all dead. And General Slater says, ah, Christ, that's it, fellas. We're going in. So we get these wide shots of helicopters escorting what appears to be about 10 large trucks full of soldiers to the exterior of this missile site that we saw earlier. Helicopters land, General Slater gets out, along with all of these other soldiers who are dressed like real military soldiers, not that rainbow-inspired THX 1138 (laughs) costume nonsense we saw earlier. And these guys all head down into the bunker below. Speaking of the bunker below, Major Baker and his other sweaty, strangely uniformed pals, they're all just poking the dead body. And they're also randomly pushing buttons on the computers this way and that. And then we get a nice metal futuristic sliding door. And who walks in but a mysterious stranger, Bo? Welcome to the show, Michael Caine. It's head scratching to me that he has yet to appear on this program, given it the, is number, stunning. The, the number of bad movies we talk about and the number of bad movies Michael Caine has been in. That Venn diagram has been completely unoverlapped for way too long. And it's nice to see him. This is maybe my favorite era of Michael Caine, that mid to late 70s. Michael Caine, where very much like Pacino, as you mentioned, in every movie there's going to be at least one scene where he's had enough. (laughs) And he's had it all through this movie. Like, he's got a short fuse, does Michael Caine in this one. Major Blake, he sees him, and he pulls his gun on him, and he says, Who the hell are you? Hello, I'm Michael Caine. You may recognize me from such successful films as Alfie in The Italian Job. I know what you're thinking. What's a fine actor like you doing in a dumpster movie like this? Don't worry, my friend. I'll soon be making numerous bad decisions in my career, including, but not limited to, the very uncomfortable film Blame It on Rio, where I'm going to play a man who has sex with his best friend's teenage daughter, and believe it or not, I shall be appearing in a fourth Jaws sequel later in my career. But for the purposes of this particular cinematic turd, I shall be playing a bee expert who eats sunflower seeds as my one idiosyncratic trait. They're like, hey, who are you? And he goes, first of all, I just told you I'm Michael Caine. Second of all, that is my van up there, and it had a briefcase in it, and I want to know what happened to that briefcase. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. First of all- We're going to ask all the questions. How did you get in here? Which, about this time, General Slater comes down, yeah. and he's like, ah, Christ, who the hell are you? How did you get in this top secret missile site? Nice to meet you, General. I'm Michael Caine. What's important- is not how I got into this building, but what happened to all these men here in this control room. General, I have been worrying about this for going on 24 hours. Because he tells them, like, I've been tracking this since last night. <laughs> and then somebody on a radar, one of the soldiers has poked around and is like, hey, I, I figured out that this is a radar. And also, there is something 30 miles out that's moving at 7 miles an hour. Ah, Christ! Wait, get after that mystery mess! It's just moving, what, 7 miles an hour? Whatever it is, it's in no hurry. So, Chad, we <laughs> send some more... <laughs> Free of charge helicopters for Irwin Allen uh-huh. uh, to investigate. So they fly above what they refer to as a black mass. And they're like, no, no, not the, the witch's ceremony. Just a big blob of black stuff in the air. And Slater's like, ah, Craig, get down there. See what that is. Ah, God damn it. 
<laughs> they dip down and they're just like, oh my God, it's bees. <laughs> And bees just start pelting the windshield. (laughs) And they're like, oh my God, General, we got to get out of here. It's bees. One of the uh, helicopters crashes. Uh Uh-huh. And while they're hearing all this over the radio and whatnot, Slater looks back at Michael Caine, who gives him this smug little smile like, look, I hate to be the one to say I told you so, but I told you so. Well, then we get the second helicopter. Yeah. It gets taken over by bees, and it also <laughs> crashes into the side of the mountain. But, Bo, I got a feeling that the footage we see of the second helicopter crashing is just the same footage of the first helicopter crashing from a different camera angle. Yeah, so... <laughs> (laughs) The bees have not only struck this facility, they have uh, downed two helicopters at this point as well. Ah, Christ. Get that mysterious British fella in here. Hey, what's your story? General, I'm Michael Caine. I have a PhD in biology, and I'm ever so smart as evidenced by my tweed jacket that has leather patches on the elbows. And if you need more convincing, I could put on a pair of glasses and smoke a pipe. Slater (laughs) says, Ah, Christ, how did you get down here in this building? General, I was tracking these bees, and they got really angry at all your men here in this facility. I got here about 10 minutes after those bees left, and when I got here, the door was open. I came down here, and everyone was asleep. But it turns out, They want to sleep, General. They've been killed by the bees. And in addition, General, it was the bees what destroyed those two helicopters just minutes ago. Ah, Christ, you don't know shit about what took down those choppers. It could have been power lines like the ones that killed William Girdler, the guy who directed Grizzly, or hell, maybe it was fog. That's what took down the copters that killed American musician Stevie Ray Vaughan and separately NBA legend Kobe Bryant. Bees. Shit, don't be ridiculous. Bees can't take down a helicopter. Bees sting people every day and it's damn rare if someone dies from a bee sting. U.S. helicopters aren't Macaulay Culkin in that tragic coming of age movie My Girl. You're insane. What do you think these bees are, John Landis? I'm not saying bees stung the helicopter, but that's how the men inside it died. Bees did cause the helicopters to crash, and yes, people do die every day from bee stings, General, especially if they're African bees. Man, and here we go, Chad. We've talked about some racist movies. Yeah. Who'd have thought that The Swarm is definitely in the discussion for the most racist movie we've ever done? It is. It's in the top three, Uh and I think with a little bit of craftsmanship, it may be the most racist movie we've ever talked about. Because it starts right here where, like you said, the, the general is like, people get stung all the time. Ah, Christ. Well, then these bees have to be African, don't they? And you're like, whoa. Huh? What, what did you say, Michael Caine? There are multiple times in this movie where someone yells out, Look out! Here come the Africans! Couldn't you just put the word bees on the end of that just to try to soften the right. overt racism? Did no one in the room. <laughs> kind of made you flashback earlier when they were like, uh, General, there's a giant black mass yeah, heading dude, to Whitesburg. We'll get to it. There are a solid half dozen times that's just like needle scratching, record ruining... <laughs> Like, what What did he just say? <laughs> Bo, in the end credits, there's a disclaimer that says, the African killer bee portrayed in this film bears absolutely no relation to the industrious, hardworking American honeybee for pollinating vital crops that feed our nation. Dude. Doesn't sound like that hardworking American bee, you know, ends up on welfare. No, sir. How do you think they got the name Welfare Queens? Queen bees, uh-huh. Chad. Welfare <laughs> queen bees. That's what we're dealing with. These American bees, they're the insect equivalent of small business owners. Job creators, if you ask me, Bo. Hive creators. They're out there making hives of their own. God, guns, old glory. That's what we need, these hardworking American bees, Bo. Dude. And then Slater says, Ah, Christ, oh, these bees aren't supposed to be here in the States for 10 years. Really, General? Let's call the White House, where the President of the United States lives. And I want you to talk to someone named Dr. Connors. He's a presidential advisor. I need you to talk to him right now. I'm Michael Caine. Ah, Christ, lock him up. <laughs> lock that crazy British weirdo up. And... <laughs> 
Then out of nowhere, Catherine Ross shows up in the movie. Uh, Dr. Catherine Ross. She has nothing to do, but I'm always happy to see Catherine Ross. She's lovely. For those who don't remember, she was in The Graduate. Mm -hmm. She rode around on that bicycle with Paul Newman and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. She's been married to Sam Elliott for almost 40 years. and that's Really? That's I didn't know that. Yeah, they've been married ever since they did The Legacy together in like 78, 79. Good for her. Good for him. Right? I mean, it's a great couple. You tell me that those two are together. I'm like, I bet their kids are fucking gorgeous. Hmm. Who's a better couple? Those two or Kevin Klein and Phoebe Cates? Uh, when you're making those calls, Chad, you're right in the high country. I mean, that's a that, tough that's one. Tough. I'm, Kevin Klein, Phoebe Cates. I was going to go Sam Elliott just for the voice. <laughs> because how great would it be if like at, right out of the womb, that baby's like, hey there, amigo. Thank you for delivering me. <laughs> so when Catherine Ross shows up, Slater is like, ah, crazy. What, what's going on with all these soldiers? Uh, where, where'd you come from? I was able to save six men who were attacked by the bees. Four of them are still alive, so I suppose my account of saving six of them was a bit exaggerated. I need antitoxins! Well, I don't happen to have them, but I do happen to have in my van an entire suitcase full of Cardiopep. Do you know Cardiopep? 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 Hmm. I just read an article about Cardiopep in the medical journals. The article was written by someone named, what was it? Michael Kane. Oh, you read my article. Let me introduce myself. I'm Michael Kane. Hey, did you write an article about Cardiopep in the medical journals? I did. I'm a big fan of Cardiopep. And then General Slater, his eyes roll and give it a, ah, shit, this guy is a real scientist. Yeah. Michael King gets taken away and is like, well, you know, we got to go find an immunologist or something. You need to call Dr. Henry Fonda. He's the best immunologist in the world. His name can be found in my wallet on the back of a business card for the Rubber Tug Tub Massage Parlor in Little Rock, Arkansas. Local cops shut the place down years ago, but the memories live on, so they say. It's the place that Robert Kraft went to after he got busted. He gets taken away and then left alone. Slater is like, oh, Christ, listen, Catherine Ross, just on a level with me. What killed those men? She's like, wait a second. You don't. Are you Are you serious? Did you, It's bees. It's fucking bees. The bees everywhere, man. It freaked everybody out. It stung everyone, everyone, everywhere, except for me. I didn't get stung. I climbed through the air conditioner event. That's why I'm okay. Ah, Christ. Looks like insects have done what no other country has ever done before. Shut down an ICBM. And then Catherine Ross giggles because he says BM. <laughs> sure, she knows what's up. Chad, now let's cut to our bees that uh -huh. are just hanging out in a tree. This family pulls up in a yellow slash green Ford Mustang. Uh-huh. And the family gets out of this car and there is a sign that the dad of this family might not be the actual father of the kid. Okay. Or gainfully employed. So there's a mom, a dad, and a kid. Just the way the dad slams the car door, I had a feeling that something was up. Barb, <laughs> get your kid. We're about to have a picnic. You know, you can. his name is Paul. You can talk directly to him. He doesn't seem to hear a goddamn word I say. How about you tell your son, Paul, to get his ass out of the Mustang, and how about you grab one of them baskets? So they go over to set up and have a picnic, which the mother says, oh, Paul, maybe later we could go for a hike and there's a waterfall nearby and i was like uh oh she's probably gonna get naked because that's what happened in grizzly and king kong and every other movie where a woman sees a waterfall and is contractually obligated to get naked and swim about in the late 70s early 80s but instead chad there's a bee just hanging out watching him with bee vision oh my god it's so awesome <laughs> just on a leaf what is up with these guys where did they come from <laughs> what is going on with all these picnics Am I right? Bo is having a picnic fun because I'm clearly team let's not go have a picnic. Yeah, it falls into that camping category for me where it has to be with someone that I really want to fuck. That's why we've never gone camping, Bo. I've never <laughs> wanted to fuck someone so bad I was willing to put up with a picnic. <laughs> it's amazing i lost my virginity at all i don't mind eating outdoors but i'm not gonna pack a lunch and then drive somewhere i gotta get out and unpack that lunch and then clean up and go back home it sounds like a lot of work just eat your lunch then go somewhere out and have fun i just feel like we take advantage of the fact that we evolved we're an indoor people now 
So this bee's hanging out, watching this family prepare to eat their lunch. Like, what's the deal with people and picnics? What is going on with all these bugs? We just set up a hive here, but already there's ants, there's aphids. They seem to be farming them. I wonder how early they're getting up. I mean, what do ants use for roosters? Paul, the kid, goes back to the car to get the mom's thermos, which, let's be honest, is full of vodka. Or Cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the picnic table, some passive aggressive behavior starts to go down with the mom and dad. Uh -huh. And this guy, he just starts eating the big piece of chicken while the mom is spraying bugs with insect repellent. And she's like, don't you want to wait for Paul? You know, our <laughs> son. He's like, I'm your son. I'm hungry. I'm not going to wait. I'm not waiting for that <laughs> son of a bitch. He never waits for me. Every time I come home, he's taking all the good pieces of chicken. And then wouldn't you know it, Bo, Paul, the kid, he gets out of the car with a the thermos of Stoli and he just screams out, Mom! <sighs> Dad! Look out! What is with making this kid an orphan? Huh? Am I right? Now that she sprayed all these toxic chemicals in the air, we're going to sting the shit out of both of them. No, no, no. Fellas, don't worry about the kid just yet. I want to take her out first. As Paul the kid looks on screaming, the movie cuts to this fallen, hollowed out log that is now projectile vomiting bees. It is like... <laughs> The exit shoot of a wood chipper just continually blowing out a flood of bees that all rush over and start attacking mom and <clears throat> dad. It's like they hooked up a fire hose to a beehive. It's one of those snow machines only filled with bees. Paul the kid, he runs and hides in the faded lime green Mustang as he watches his mom and Derek attack by bees until they're dead. Now, credit where credit is due. The actors who played the mom and Derek they allowed themselves to be totally covered with bees and film for this movie. Let's put that in some perspective because there was also a unit uh, on this film that did nothing but clip the stingers off of bees so that when they did these shots, there was really no danger other than being creeped out by bees. For people who didn't grow up in the late 70s and early 80s, there was some weird shit going on with bees. Yeah. Like people made beards out of bees and on the TV show, show that's incredible which was just what a freak show cavalcade of people doing dumb shit so that people like you and me Bo, would watch it and like they would cover their whole body in bees and walk around well it turns out like i know some people who keep bees and stuff and it turns out that most bees are actually pretty docile and you can open up a hive and just reach your hand in there and scoop them out and shit and not really get yeah, stung but that's no excuse to make a beard out of them oh of course not no that is a cry for help chad as most entertainment is. Like those two fat twins on the moped, you think they weren't crying themselves to sleep at night over their Domino's pizzas? I thought you were going to talk about this podcast being a cry for help, but that's a different story. I said what I said. <laughs> so Paul the kid, he runs and hides in the sports car, and bees just cover the top half of this vehicle. Hey Paul, how about you get another parent? Maybe one nicer to bees and we won't have to kill him. Paul pops the key in the ignition, starts the car the same way he does when Derek makes him go pick up a sixer late at night because Derek's a little too drunk to drive again. You tell them if they give you any shit to call me and I will tell them I gave you my license. You know what? That's a cosign check you got in your hand. That's as good as cash. Don't skimp on the cigarettes. I like my brand. Paul, the kid, turns on the wipers of the car and just sweeps away a good two inch thick layer of bees that have enclosed this vehicle. And then Paul just slams down on the gas and drives off to go get help, I guess. I think he's just getting away. It is just survival at this point, you know? He's probably just been dreaming of this moment, praying to God to give him an exit. And now he's got it. Yeah, I think he's a little upset about his mom going, but Derek is not someone he's going to lose any sleep over. <laughs> we cut back to Missile Command and a different general who has four stars. Dude, it's Cameron Mitchell, who is one of the icons of shitty movies. This is a dude who would show up on any film up through like the mid to late 80s before alcoholism finally claimed him. But sweaty Cameron Mitchell, a uh, shout out on <laughs> Legion podcast to Hello, This is the Doom Show, which included the phrase sweaty Cameron Mitchell in their theme song. Well, he's in the right movie. Yeah, for sure. He's uniquely not sweaty in this. But yes, he is basically Slater's boss. And 
and, and the liaison with the president or whatever and he wants to know like hey who's that guy back there hello i'm michael kane bee expert and honey aficionado bees are killing people and destroying helicopters you can check my credentials with dr connor's at the white house he is the president's advisor you must listen to me and you must also listen to my convincing british accent wow this guy is excitable all right look i'll call the arthur connor's i'll see what's up but for (laughs) your sake you better hope he knows who you are because if he doesn't god is my witness we're gonna strap you to a missile and we're gonna shoot you into space you call Connors right there, you just get him on the night! I don't even know what he's saying now. Hang up. We cut to Marysville, which Bo looks a lot like downtown Hazard County because that's where the Dukes of Hazard was filmed. Uh-huh. On the Warner Brothers Midwest backlot set. And we are introduced to a lover's triangle that we don't need to spend a lot of time on here. No. Which is we- Felix, who is new to town, Clarence, who is Dean Jones, and Maureen, who is Olivia. No, no, no. It's not Dean Jones. It's Fred McMurray. Fred McMurray. Murray, sorry. I- the original absent-minded professor and father of my three sons. Easy to mix up, but don't let it happen again. I'll do my best. If you gave me that Dean Jones versus Fred McMurray quiz, I would fail miserably at it. So keep that in your back pocket for a future episode. <laughs> the whole deal here is that they're all 65. 65? Dude, these people are pushing 70 plus. Look, man, this is my life. This is what I'm looking forward to. I'm not that far away from being single and 60. When I look at this, I'm like, all right, I think Felix has some real game here. It's three old people that you don't want to see have sex talking about having sex with each other but this isn't having sex relationships this is well i guess we're gonna be together till one of us dies when the lights go out (laughs) Eh, a lot of lube on both sides whatever it takes man you gotta whatever it takes tape your dick to a yardstick and hope that keeps it up (laughs) it's just a mess anyway none of this plot matters you could edit out every single one of these characters every single scene with them it would not slow down the movie whatsoever the only thing that's significant here other than to establish this love triangle that ultimately does not matter at all Uh is is the fact that paul the kid rolls into town in this mustang Paul the kid comes hauling ass into town, tires squealing, he's fishtailing this Mustang, and he crashes the car. And they open up the door, and the kid is just, they killed him, they killed him! And just losing his shit, as you would, like you just saw your mom and Derek all just mowed down by these bees. He's covered in sweat. Olivia de Havilland, who we purposely didn't mention that she's the principal of the school in town, she grabs Paul the kid. And and if I'm her, I'm like, this kid's tripping balls. He's high on something. Yeah, she should just take him immediately to the school nurse. But instead, we cut to Cameron Mitchell again. Yeah, it's me calling from the president. It uh, turns out he says, not only does Arthur Connors know who this guy is, the president has told me to put uh, Michael Kane in charge of this whole thing. Uh huh. And Michael Kane is like very coy and my authority. And Cameron Mitchell goes, ugh total yeah christ i gotta do what this asshole says he's not even from america it's just a real rubbing salt in the wound please general slater get the file from my briefcase titled personal it's filled with some personal nudes and i would like to get an honest opinion on my level of fitness also i would like my pouch of sunflower seeds back remember it is the quirky thing that defines my character after all and aside from the black and white photography which is tastefully executed You will also find the names and numbers of everyone that I want flown in to handle our little bee problem. You just tell them that the war that I've always talked about is finally happening. And we have all the equipment listed on a piece of paper that we need flown down here. We have very little time, General. And as soon as he leaves, General Slater is like, Ah, Christ, Bradford Doman, come here. I want you to keep your eyes on this guy. I don't trust this British guy, if that's what he calls himself. Self. so we follow michael kane t- where Catherine ross has kind of given him an update on on these guys that they're in critical condition but they're stable and michael kane has a moment where he's like they don't look very good do they which i think <laughs> is really funny then there's a phone call for Catherine ross and she's like oh my god 
Paul. And Michael Caine is like, wait a second. Who is this Paul? Is he a rival for your affection? And she's like, no, no. He's this kid that I know because I'm the town doctor too, apparently. And I'm also in the military. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody kind of does everything here. It's like a volunteer fire department. This is the volunteer missile command. Let's not forget, Chad, that B expert Michael Caine also apparently invented some kind of cardiac treatment with his cardiopep. <laughs> I, I don't know an entomologist would necessarily be a chemist as well as a cardiologist. He, he wears a lot of hats. So Catherine Ross is like, I gotta go because only this kid survived. And Michael Gaines like, oh yeah, sounds like bees. I'm going with you. They arrive at the hospital and they go up to this kid Paul's room and we find Paul lying in his bed, screaming uncontrollably because he's having a hallucination that a giant bee is trying to kill him. And Michael Caine comes over with Catherine Ross and Michael Caine says, hello, I'm Michael Caine. Now, Paul, listen to me. There are no bees in this room, Paul. Paul? No, but I see one. There's a giant no, bee right Paul, there. Paul, listen to me. I know what you're going through. All right, Paul? What you're having is a bad trip. There are no bees in this room. Look, Paul, there's no bees. I promise you, all right? Hey, you there's know a one right there. And wouldn't you know it, Bo, a giant bee the size of like an extra large beach ball slowly fades in and the bee says, what's the deal with hospital food? <laughs> what is going on with delusions? I mean, I'm not even real. Or am I? There's no way to tell. Paul, listen to me. There are no bees. Paul, stick your hand out into the air. Are you crazy? You that see. big bee will be hide it right off. No, Paul, it won't. There's no bees. Stick your hand into the air and you will see that it is all in your head, Paul. You can do it, Paul. You have absolutely no reason to trust me, Paul, but I'm an entomologist, cardiologist, psychologist. Paul, listen to me. The president gave me absolute authority, all right? Oh, absolute authority, all right. Ah! Oh my God, the bee disappeared. That's right, Paul, because I'm much smarter than you. You are a little boy and you mean nothing to me. Michael Caine leaves and Catherine Ross, she watches him walk away and here she falls in love with Michael Caine because the music turns romantic. She, in fairness, gives him some solid, you just cured a boy fuck eyes. <laughs> and this is also worth kind of noting that this is our first appearance of the sexy Latino doctor. Dr. Martinez. Yeah, that as soon as Michael Caine gets Paul to touch the air and prove there's no B, Dr. Martinez says, you know, I tried everything. <laughs> he did not respond at all. Your man here, he is some kind of genius. It's <laughs> so funny, man. Michael Caine then goes to the site where Paul's family was killed excuse me, where Paul's mother was killed. And it's here that Michael Caine offers sunflower seeds to General Slater for the first time. And Slater says, ah, Christ, look, I'm not a bird. Keep that shit to yourself. Are you sure, General? High in potassium, low in sodium. Did I stutter? Keep that shit to yourself. Fine, then I am just going to kneel down here and I'm going to look through the grass, General. I think the bees did this to a plastic cup, General. They made these tiny, smaller pieces of plastic. Hmm, American honeybees. They can't even break the skin of a grape. But these bees, the Africans, they're tearing up everything they get their hands on. And these Africans are breeding and using the plastic to insulate their hives. Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> the swarm! Can we stop, please, for a minute? Slater says, ah, Christ, no bee is that smart, which is a direct contradiction to a line he has later, but it also sets up Michael Caine to say, well, maybe these African bees are. So we cut back to the base where Dr. Krim shows up in the form of Henry Fonda. And yeah. Henry Fonda is about 117 when they shot this movie. Yeah, that's why he's in a wheelchair. Michael Caine like lifts him out of the helicopter. You know, hello, Dr. Krim, I'm Michael Caine. As he's doing that, <laughs> Henry Fonda steals some sunflower seeds out of Michael Caine's little pouch. And Michael Caine says, are you ready to get to work, Henry Fonda? I'm ready. Now that I've gotten some of your sunflower seeds, yes, yes. What? Why am I here? Who said? I need a nap. Oh boy, there goes the bladder. You might want to hold me away from your chest. Put me back in the chair. That's where all the padding is. Oh God. <laughs> you should put a towel underneath my anus. You're going to thank me later. He just drops him in this wheelchair like an old scarecrow and they take him inside where Henry Fonda reviews the charts on these soldiers. Uh, of dead people? No, no, no. It's the ones who got stung and they seem to be oh, getting yeah. better. Soon to be dead people. Yeah. You're doing all you can for them. If the bees that stung them were 
Africans. There's nothing we can do. You give them cardio pep? Yes, I had a whole van full of cardio pep, and mm. I gave it all to them. That's all you can do. Is it cold in here? There's a gag, kind of a joke, I suppose, speaking of, where on the way out, the wheelchair is squeaking, and Michael Caine, because he's always at the verge of a volcanic eruption, is like, hey, Henry Fonda, have you ever thought of getting this squeaky wheel fixed before maybe I shove you and it out of this building? Huh? What'd you hear? The wheel. Have you ever thought of fixing the wheel? No, I've never been there. All right, somebody fix his wheel. Henry Fonda says, yeah, I plan to get out of this chair. Uh, you see, yeah, how you gonna do that? Because I was led to believe that you were a hopeless cripple. I then studied Tibetan levitation to get out of the chair. A couple of hundred more years, I'm gonna float around, you understand? Yes, Dr. Henry Fonda, I'm sure you will. Cuckoo, cuckoo. He makes a little circle by his ear. Uh, he just shoves a bit to the morgue. Here, you and all your men are gonna stay here with all these gross dead people. Hey, these guys look like me when I get out of the shower. Yeah, soon, boys, soon. Let's see here we get introduced to another subplot that doesn't matter at all to this movie. When Slim Pickens... Welcome to the movie Slim Pickens. Yeehaw. <laughs> And you'd think he's going to do something, but he doesn't. And what he does is not what you want to see him do. Right. You're just getting Slim Pickens to act in a room with way better actors <laughs> where they could just sit in silent judgment of him. It's really uncomfortable to watch. Well, all right. So he shows up at the gate and maybe when Richard Widmark shows up and you got Richard Widmark, the Slim Pickens on the acting field. Uh huh. Nah, that's a fairly even equation L tilts towards richard widmark of course slim pickens shows up outside the fence around this missile command center and he says i want to see my son and these lazy jack and ninnies are telling me a no uh, oh christ we can't just let you in uh, who are you anyway i'm the county engineer and i'll shut off the water to this place in 10 minutes uh, you can't do that I'll, I'll call the president listen to me general Word is, a bunch of bees got in here, and one of them what killed my son, who's also fortunately stationed at the base in the county where I'm the county engineer. I want to see that my son wasn't one of those people who was killed by one of them bees. And finally, Slater just gives in. Hey, come on in here. We got a He's bunch dead. of dead kids. Let's see if one of them's yours. So, Michael <laughs> Caine checks in with Henry Fonda. So, tell me, Henry Fonda, how deadly are these bees? Well, the venom in these men is greater than anything I've ever seen. Three stings of... And... <sighs> nope. He fell asleep again. Uh, All right, wake up. Uh, uh, kill the average man! I've been thinking, Henry Fonda. You know, I always knew that we've been waging a war with insects for 15 years, but I never thought I'd see the final battle in my lifetime. And further, I never thought it would be the bees. They've always been our friends. It turns out the bees are a bunch of dicks. Then, <laughs> Michael Caine saying, they've always been our friends, is so funny. <laughs> It's such a bad line. There, there's worse dialogue in the movie, but that's pretty bad. General Slater comes into this morgue with Slim Pickens, and the general just goes dead body to dead body, reading each toe tag like he's looking for what Christmas presents belong to him. Until he gets to the one where he's just like, yeah, oh boy, uh, hey, what did you say your name was again? Oh boy, uh, well, same last name. Maybe that's a coincidence. <laughs> Slim Pickens just gathers this body up. I'm about to take my boy with me. Slater's like, wait, wait, wait. Look, I, I can take you to your son, but you just can't carry a corpse out of here now. And You just try and stop me. And if you shoot me, I tell you, General, I'd be better off for it. The way he phrases it is, the only way you're going to stop me from taking my boy out is to shoot me to stop me. And I'd thank you if you would. But there's this great moment where as they're trying to decide whether or not to let Slim Pickens take this corpse out of here. <laughs> Slater looks at Michael Caine, who looks at Henry Fonda, who is blank-faced. Back to Caine, back to Slater, and finally he's just like, all right, I guess so. Why, well, Christ, what's the harm? It's one last body we gotta go bury out in the desert and claim we don't know what happened to it. I gotta be honest, we're up to our necks with bee-stung bodies, so one less isn't gonna tip the scales. <laughs>
That's one less uncomfortable house visit I've got to make. You're saving me a trip, honestly. Thanks. So outside a helicopter, of course, lands because of the grateful participation of the U.S. Air Force. And it's Richard Chamberlain. And a neatly trimmed beard. Well, he's always had a fine beard, Chad. And immediately, though, Chamberlain is like, I didn't want to come here, and I think you suck, Michael Caine. There's also some other science titian with him that they don't really give a name to. He don't matter. He doesn't, but he's strangely there for most of the movie in the background. Yeah. When a lot of major characters are dying and like Fred, the science guy, is kind of hanging out till the end in a weird way. When you think of Richard Chamberlain, what do you associate him with? Uh, Shogun, mostly. Uh, or Thornbird. Yeah. I mean, he's just kind of the miniseries guy. Alan yeah. Quartermain, those terrible movies with uh, Sharon oh, yeah. Stone. I forgot about those. Yeah, well, <laughs> give it time. Let's not count too many, uh, too many chickens here. I think that might make an appearance one of these days. We cut over to Michael Caine. He's down in the bunker and he's listening to these audio recordings of the B attack. And at first there's the sound of an alarm system going off. And then the alarm system fades into the sound of bees attacking. And Michael Caine says, listen, it's the bees. And now you can hear the soldiers talking about the bees showing up. And now the soldiers are narrating how the bees are getting inside and stinging them to death. This might be a clue. All right. First of all, the guy on the tape yelling, Jerry, behind you. It's B. <laughs> is one of the most ridiculous things you could possibly say about bees what's the deal with him knowing my name's jerry what is the deal with all these tapes i mean are you recording are you playing i don't understand it meanwhile sting we go back to communication headquarters and michael kane slowly walks down a hall until he eventually reaches a briefing room dude did you notice henry fonda in the background of this shot uh -huh. napping no they're pushing him across the background like he's wheeling himself across and he kicks a door open <laughs> forgetting his legs aren't supposed to work it's one of my favorite things in the movie is Henry Fonda kicking this door open from a wheelchair. It's quite good. <laughs> so Michael Cage shows up and we're having some sort of a briefing and the room is full of who knows who these people are. A bunch of local bigwigs. One of them is Olivia de Havilland, school principal, and Fred McMurray, who I think is the mayor of the town. That's maybe... right. He is the mayor of Marysville. Yeah. Also, a pharmacist slash morphine addict. <laughs> That's right. It's a real permanent midnight for the mayor of Marysville. <laughs> Dr. Richard Chamberlain and his neatly trimmed beard. They're in the crowd and he speaks up at the news conference and he says, I've been studying bees as much as you. And let's all agree to call them Brazilian bees and not use the word african so much you know and michael Caine just shuts it down immediately that is your name and i've heard other people say it but to me they are africans we are all going to call them africans agreed these bees came from the caribbean most likely riding on the wings of a hurricane all right they are african bees they are not brazilian now henry fonda do you have anything you would like to add to these proceedings <laughs> I'll have a pimento cheese sandwich. Nope, it is not lunchtime. I need you to talk here at the briefing about the venom. You know, I just want to double back. Dr. Richard Chamberlain actually does say, you know, there's no evidence that these are Brazilian bees, but if you insist, we can call them African. Like, he, he concedes to call them African bees. Well, Kane's got full authority. Everything he says goes. He's bestowed by the president. Yeah. You see what happens when that uh, when that power is, is given uh, unconditionally. Things yeah. don't go well. And Henry Fonda wakes up enough to be like, yeah, it turns out poisonous as shit. Kill you dead. <laughs> Michael Caine puts up a slide on an overhead projector. And there's a whole bunch of science nonsense that nobody in the crowd understands. What it's a real Dr. Frankenstein. Isn't it true that you have to do a 26 different tests to show the difference between a Brazilian bee and an African bee? I made science research today on a sample <laughs> of the hypothesis and the data evidence of the Hippocratic Oath to prove one thing conclusively. Only one bee could have killed all these people, the Africans. Bees. Oh. A rump, a rump, a rump. Oh, my goodness. And then Michael came to throw Richard Chamberlain a bone here 
He's like, but let me say, I would like you to head up one of the teams because I don't respect you, but you are on the team and I want you to feel included. You will head up the environmental team. That other nameless nerd doctor will head up a different team. Dr. Henry Fonda, who, when he wakes up, will create an antidote. Are there any questions? Yes, Fred McMurray, inventor of Flubber and murderer of a stranger on a train. You have a question. Well, not so much a a question as it is a comment. Uh, First of all, thank you for hosting this. I think we all appreciate the coffee here, everyone. Second of all, our darn air raid siren hasn't worked in about 45 years. So we're going to fix that. So when your horrifying killer, (laughs) I think you called them African bees, is that right? That is correct. When they show up. We call them Africans. For short, we're just going to keep the bees on the end of that for press releases in the community, but we're going to fix our air raid sirens. So when these horrifying African killer bees show up, we can warn our citizens to get indoors lest they be murdered in the streets of our town. Kudos to you, Fred McMurray, for taking a very short story and dragging it out as long as possible. I appreciate that. Does any other oldster here have something that they would want to say to drag out this movie longer than necessary? Yes, I... Hello, I'm Maureen. I'm the principal. We're going to make sure that our children come inside as soon as they see the first killer bee. She looks around. She's like, the African bees. Somebody asks, hey, how long is all this going to go on anyway? Until we destroy the African bees. 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 Yeah. The African bees. Yes. Until it has destroyed us. Mm, okay. We'll get right on it. I don't think Michael Caine is the good guy in this movie, Bo. No. <laughs> not at all. In a lot of ways, I feel like the swarm itself is just like God's vengeance on man. <laughs> that we somehow dodge briefly we'll get to it but the end of this movie is just hell it is shot against the backdrop of the hell at the hospital meanwhile chad Uh paul our survivor kid Uh just busts out of the hospital yeah his buddies show up with their bikes and his bike Uh uh-huh it's a real et scenario yeah the music is all upbeat and adventurous you're like whoa something's afoot they pass felix coming out of the bank or something he's just like all right kids you boys have fun poking at mother nature's fiercest predator we do get introduced to yet another character that we don't need in this film a very pregnant patty duke Aston. Uh huh. Yeah, she's the waitress in the town diner. And her husband is dead. And I couldn't figure out did he die getting killed by bee stings out at the only place that people work, the missile silo? Or was he just another dead guy? I think that's the case. Because the way that they put, like, Felix goes into this cafe and and kind of gives the owner some shit about, you know, it kind of sucks that you're making her work on the day she found out that her husband, Jerry, was murdered by bees. <laughs> he's like, well, I tried to get her to stay home, but she said if she had to sit around and look at those four walls, she was just going to take his service revolver and shoot herself in the head. Yeah. And Felix is like, well, shit. All right. I guess maybe she should be here. I don't know. She should probably talk to someone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you have to call the police. She's a danger to herself and others. Yeah. And me. So Felix is like, I can't be any part of this. So he leaves. Patty Duke has an Oscar, Bo. <laughs> well, it's a long ways between this and her Oscar. Just like Richard Chamberlain, she did a whole bunch of TV movie of the week stuff and her sitcom. Hell, she had sex with Gomez Adams regularly. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. You know Sean Astin isn't his kid? Is that right? Uh Uh-uh, he adopted him when he was three. His dad was a a music producer. Patty Duke's life was pretty bonkers. She was hooking up with three dudes at one time and- I always liked John Astin a lot. Good for you, Patty Duke. Yeah, she seemed to get it together. Like any of us. Look, we're all just trying. So Felix hands Maureen (laughs) some flowers and there's a whole spiel about like, hey, I'm a smart guy, but all my brains are in my hands. Oh my God, move along. Just this don't matter, Bo. No, you're right. You're right. I motion that we skip this part of the movie about the three old people want to fall in love and eventually have sex. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Suffice to say, this all ends when later we talk about a train exploding. They were on it and they all die. So, <laughs> right. Meanwhile, our knucklehead kids have decided uh-huh. that they're going to launch an attack on this beehive, but are doing some recon. Like Paul's got some binoculars checking it out. They've located the, the hive in question. But before we launch that attack, we cut back to our command center. 
Uh huh. Where a dude watching the radar is like, "Hey, a uh, big swarm is a couple of hundred miles away from Houston." Ah, Christ! Send up a helicopter with a bunch of chemicals to kill the bees. What, General? Are you sitting here telling me that you're gonna dump a bunch of chemicals on these bees? Do you know that you are gonna kill our friends, the American bees, and not just the Africans? We can kill all the Africans we want, but these weapons are indiscriminate, and they will kill Africans and Americans alike. It will disrupt the food chain this all happens in this shocking film it ends with him just going no no general be dropping chemicals on the american base after michael Caine just furiously stalks off after yelling at this general bradford <laughs> dillman rolls up on general slater and is like uh hey do you want to do that airdrop or slater's so just like oh christ get out of here i ain't even look at you <laughs> <laughs> Just the worst timing possible. Like, shit rolls downhill on poor Bradford Dillman in this movie. I'm gonna go get some donuts. You want some donuts? Hey, who wants donuts? That's great <laughs> news. How about we celebrate with some donuts? <laughs> Tip of the hat to Charles Grimm. Too soon. Too soon. Michael Caine is yes. listening to tapes of the attack again uh -huh. just to establish that he is thick-headed and it's going to take him another hour 45 to figure out what he's listening to and why it's important. We cut back to the woods and Pete the Kid and his two pals show up with what else, Bo? Molotov cocktails in hand. And they just start checking Molotovs at the hive. And then when the bees are like, hey, what is up with all this fire? I mean, we're losing brothers and sisters left and right. Is it those kids? Everybody, let's kill those kids. So these kids run off, and you would think they would get on their bikes to get away, but instead they just hide under metal trash cans like Oscar the Grouch. Yeah, and meanwhile you can hear the bees hitting the can outside because they're all metal because uh -huh. it was the 70s, and you just hear tick, 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 tick. And poor Paul, of course, is having a straight-up PTSD episode in the trash can as he contemplates what a god-awful idea this was in the first place. You mean because earlier in the day, around lunchtime, he saw his mother and Derek killed by bees? This has to be later, because later in the movie, Catherine Ross talks about dropping Paul off after the funeral of his parents. And so this is some days later, one presumes. Either that, or they have a quick turnaround on funeral homes. They might be extremely Jewish. Like, you have to get them in the ground within 30 minutes. <laughs> right, or it's free. <laughs> right. That's the Domino's Pizza funeral <laughs> service of Marysville. <laughs> we don't even check the pulse. You bring us a body, we will put it in a fucking box and plant that thing in the ground. <laughs> With or without memorial, doesn't matter. All the same price. It's a package deal. 1500 bucks. <laughs> no questions asked. Are we government insured? Hell no. Cash only. We accept cash and Bitcoin. That is it. Sometimes trade. What kind of car you got? Do you have any of them Pokemon cards that Target stopped selling? <laughs> we'll take some of those. The bees eventually just take off. They're gone. And they stop attacking the three kids. Sensing their safety, the boys pop out from under the trash cans and they run away. We cut to Michael Caine's tan conversion van. And he's riding around with Catherine Ross. And they're looking for Paul the kid. Like he has nothing better to do. Bo, those are my words exactly in my notes. <laughs> I think the real deal here is that as they're driving, he's like, so... How about you tell me a little bit about yourself? How liberal are you with your sexual encounters? Before she can really get into that, up in the sky, they see two large swarms of bees. And Michael Caine says, look, they are headed toward Marysville. So they have to pull a Yui to head back to Marysville and warn everyone that the bees are coming. And Bo, we cut to Marysville where innocent children are playing outside of the school, having a good time, enjoying life. And here the movie attempts a little bit of humor. I mentioned it earlier. There's this kid comically licking a sucker as Fred McMurray waits in the school office lobby with a competing bouquet of flowers to woo the elderly Olivia de Havilland. And we get more old man courting an old woman nonsense. Move along, move along. Yes. The movie then introduces us to another character, a female news reporter who just shows up to be sensational because Jaws ripoffs usually have a nosy reporter. So we yes. got to have one of those. And right on cue, Michael Caine and Catherine Ross come blasting through town yelling, and I quote, the Africans are coming. The Africans are coming. Oh my God, Chad. 
How is this not bad everywhere? This should be like Huckleberry Finn. You shouldn't even be allowed to rent this movie, much less purchase it. I got it on Blu-ray. Somebody remastered this movie. <laughs> we are like, this is important. We got to preserve this. The thing about the racism in this is I could see where the filmmakers, like when you point it out to them, they're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh what oh shit <laughs> we didn't even think oh it's everywhere oh erwin you fucked up oh erwin 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 oh no how are all the prints the prints are gone They're the prints oh my god 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 <laughs> pamela come in here take a memo first of all i would like to apologize unreservedly it's stunning while that is happening maureen the principal if you'll recall is like oh my god the the bees are here and so she gets on the pa and she's like hello um yes if everyone would just come inside now i think the bees are outside if everyone would come in cut to outside where kids are murdered littering the sidewalk Yes, it's slow motion killing of elementary age school children outside playing during recess. Yeah. And they go down one by one, just drifting towards Earth as bees are flying everywhere. And Maureen sees all this through a bee covered window and she turns around and gives a good no. And she's covered in sweat too. She's all pocked up with moisture. Oh my God, it's so funny. That one kid who was licking the sucker, he gets killed and you see bees all over his sucker. <laughs> bees are like, what's the deal with lollipops? I mean, once you're done, you've got nothing but a wet stick. It, Dude, it's so <laughs> fucking funny. I know that this is played straight. Like you said, this is a Zucker film waiting to happen. The fact that they never did this kind of disaster movie is a little bit of a shame, but it's hysterical. If you are of a mind, my God, this scene is funny. Just skip over all the romantic old people stuff. Absolutely. But as soon as these bees start attacking and then you've got the reporter, she gets a couple of her knucklehead buddies to roll camera on top of the van until yeah. they start getting stuck by bees. They're like, fuck this. Let us back in in the van. Michael Caine and Catherine Ross rush to the diner to take cover. But Michael Caine breaks out the window so that he can get inside, creating an opening for the bees. And Catherine Ross, she gets stung, Bo. But then Patty Duke shows up to give her some ice for the bee sting and then some stunt man he gets stung by bees so much that he just jumps in the air and crashes through the full window of the diner oh uh, and it's all in slow motion there's more slow motion in this scene than in a Zack snyder movie it's just sick with it and <laughs> then because he's busted through the window of the diner and all the bees can get in hey look everybody somebody opened the window what's the deal with calling it a diner why don't they call it a dinner I mean, you're eating dinner at the diner. It only makes sense. Uh, Michael Caine is like, all right, this place has a cooler. We can all get in there because bees don't like the coat. And the owner of the place just jumps in the cooler and shuts the doors like, yoink, leaves them in this pantry. But Catherine Ross is like, oh my God, can the bees get us in here? And Michael Caine checks a uh, thermometer. No, it is 40 degrees. Anything below 50 and bees get all iggledy piggledy. So it means nothing that the owner shut them out, and now, it also is never mentioned again. Michael Caine does hug Catherine Ross, who is now sweating profusely, and she sees a hallucination of a tiny bee inside Michael Caine's eye. Yes. What's the deal with visions in other people's eyes? So, finally the bee attack is over. We go back to Missile Command. Yeah, it's just Henry Fonda watching a news report about this shit. Where's the weather channel? I need to know if I can golf. We go back to Marysville, and they're just filling body bags left and right with the corpses of humans killed by the bee invasion. Michael Caine, he's there, yeah. and he gets a call from Dr. Henry Fonda, who says, uh, One of the soldiers who got stung a couple of times, he died. Lucky son of a bitch. Look, I know that you want the sweet release of death, but I need you to find an antidote to this bee venom. All right. Also, there are over 200 people dead here. All right. And it's all because of the bees. Yep. I got to hear you. Good talking to you. And Bradford Dillman <laughs> shows up to fetch Michael Caine. Then there's a whole deal where the kid Paul is told by Catherine Ross that he has to confess that he's well, he, the one. He tells her. He's like, it's all my fault. I threw Molotov cocktails at the swarm. Catherine Ross says, you're right, Paul. It is all your fault. You screwed up big. 
<laughs> yeah. You got to go tell Michael Caine about all this. You, a child, need to go tell an adult about this horrible thing you've done. And outside, Slater is like, listen, Michael Caine, we're going to evacuate this whole town and we're going to spray every bush and tree from here to the Gulf with a bunch of toxic shit. And Michael Caine naturally immediately launches into a scream at him Uh uh-huh well general what are you gonna do about the wind and the water and how it takes this spray of yours and mixes it into the food supply and also blows it into another town with schools and nunneries and places where they have little babies what do you call those baby hospitals what about that general Listen, General, Dr. Richard Chamberlain, in his neatly trimmed beard, has been out collecting live Africans. Oh. Actual dialogue from this movie. He brought thousands of them back to the complex. And when that swamp finds out that their fellow Africans have been abducted and taken to a foreign land, the other Africans are going to show up and they're going to be pissed off and they're going to destroy everything. Like, is the swarm the movie? Do you have an agenda you're trying to progress with this narrative? I don't know what side of history you're on exactly actually i do but do you know what <laughs> side of history you're on it's definitely trying to say something about like you shouldn't use pesticides and actually the honeybee is an important part of the ecosystem unless you're going to kill africans and that's where everything falls apart is it's a good message until you get to well as long as we kill all the africans everything else will be cool it's not just uncomfortable, it's shocking. Michael Caine wraps all this up. Are you suggesting, General Slater, that the bees have emotions like humans and that they would exact revenge on others? Yeah. Ah, Christ. I always credit my enemy with equal human intelligence. Did you ever see that movie Home Alone or Mouse Hunt with Nathan Lane? They underestimated their opponent and ended up with the shit end of that conflict. Look, I'm going to use pesticide to eradicate every African swarm in this area. And then Michael Caine just says, okay, let's evacuate Marysville. I have to go. And Paul, the kid, catches up to him. Hey, sorry, Michael Caine. I got to tell you, I took some Molotov cocktails and I hurled them at a bunch of bees. And I think I'm the one who caused all this stuff to happen here in Marysville. Oh, listen up, Paul. I would have done the very same thing. You got to believe me. I need you to kind of ignore any hallucinogenic bees you may see flying around over my shoulders. Paul, listen to me, Paul. When I was your age, my mother and a guy who pretended to be my dad died in a fire. It's not good to grow up without a mother and a guy pretending to be your dad, Paul. You may ask yourself, Paul, did I set that fire? Well, I think that's a question that's good to ponder late at night when you think about the fact that you killed all these people here in Maryville. Could Michael Caine come for me tonight? Or could it be tomorrow night? Will he exact his vengeance now? Or will he let me stew for a while and think about how short and how brief life can be? Hmm, that's a good question to think about, Paul. Off you go. Feel better, Paul. Seems like you're crying a bit more now than it was when you first came up to talk to me. Bye, Orphan. Before he can get his car, though, the reporter stops him and is like, hey, do you have 90 seconds to talk? For you, I've got three minutes. Let's just chit-chat about bullshit that won't matter at all to the plot of this movie. And that's what they do. The only question he really answers is, is it possible that this could happen other places? Yes, yes. It is not just possible. It's likely that these Africans will kill more Americans. Huh. I, you want to do another take or something? No. I said what I said. It's so uncomfortable. Yeah, it's terrible. And he goes to Henry Fonda in his lab where they have gathered all these bees from the Marysville attack. And there's one guy just tapping a metal rod against the glass just to fuck with him. I guess I couldn't ever figure out a scientific reason to do it other than to say, you think you can hear that? What do you think we look like to them? There's zapping a little tray with electricity. Yeah. Like that, I guess that does something. Well, it, so that is a thing that they, they spread like some gel or something over it to attract the bees. And then they hit it with electricity electricity and it makes the bees sting this grid and it kind of milks the venom out of them is the idea I got, oh yeah 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 so that's what they do and then they like get all this bee venom to collect to, to experiment with and it's this super long scene of them going through the process of this we need an antidote to the bee poison by tomorrow morning so get to work dr henry fonda 
I don't know what days are. Back at the missile base, Catherine Ross shows up and she's feeling 100% now. There's a side conversation between Catherine Ross and Major Baker regarding her having goo goo eyes for <laughs> Michael Caine, which goes nowhere. Yeah. And I mean, we talked about the old people romance and this in the movie Jaws, the screenplay writers and filmmakers knew to cut all of the marital turmoil from the book out of that movie because in the book brody's wife has an affair with hooper could you imagine the two of them sneaking off to a hotel in the middle of that film no let's keep things moving along people <laughs> this movie doesn't do that all i know is you're going to ignore this particular woman until she has an affair with me in a hotel all i know is that you're going to ignore my penis until it comes over and it sticks you in the ass oh i never did that with roy Patty Duke <laughs> is saying goodbye to the doctor because the whole town's being evacuated. And he kind of pulls her into his office to be like, so look, I just wanted to say I'm very sorry about Jerry. And also, yes. you know, if you ever I, wanted to, no, I don't know, get some I'm coffee. Gonna, no, maybe we I've got to go. They're evacuating oh. the town. Oh, yeah. You're, no, you're evacuating. I know. I'm just, yeah. it's good to see you. I'm I, happy for you. I'm happy for the baby. Th I, thank you. Okay, I'm walking out the door now. Okay, bye-bye. Do -bye. you have my card? you have my number? I have it. I have okay. it. Thank you so much, Dr. Mallard. Mar Martinez. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, I'll be thinking of you. And so the reporter lets us all know, like, hey, everybody's leaving by train. There's a bit with Felix and the mayor waiting for Maureen, blah, blah, blah. Keep Patty on. Duke makes it to the train, but as soon as she gets to the train, she goes into labor, and they're like, oh, we got to take her right back to the hospital. I like that Major Barker gets a tongue lashing from General Slater for shit-talking Michael Caine behind Michael Caine's back. Because the general's like, hey, where is Michael Caine anyway? Anyway, and Bradford Dillman says, oh, I'm sure he'll show up just in time to take credit for the evacuation. Ah, Christ. I'm not going to sit here and listen to you backstab Michael Caine. He may be an asshole in this movie, but you see Hannah and her sisters or the Cider House rules? The man's got two Oscars, for God's sake. Show some respect, Major Baker. It's actually a pretty good chewing out. It's one of the more enjoyable things in this movie because it's at least dynamic. You don't come over and stab a guy in his back. You take the knife and you plunge it in his chest while you're looking him in the eyes. Then you go and you fuck his wife. That's the American way. Cut to Michael Caine and Catherine Ross wandering the empty streets of Marysville at night. Apparently they forgot that bees are out killing everyone. So, Catherine Ross, I'm just curious, have you ever had sex in public? And considering that much of this town has been evacuated, I would say that the danger of being discovered is substantially lower. <laughs> what? You know, I was just mourning what's happened here on Main Street of our sleepy little town and how all of these businesses owned by both moms and Pops are now closed, including the bookstore and the hardware store. Yes, it is very sad. Also, speaking of Moms and Pops, when mothers and fathers lie together, sometimes they can comfort each other. Are you in need of comforting, Catherine Ross? Oh, no, I don't think so. Am I the only one here getting sweaty for all the wrong reasons? Oh, no. We then cut to, is it a model train or is it stock footage of a train? I think there's a little of both. That's the magic okay. of Irwin Allen. <laughs> is that you never know when stock footage is going to sneak in on you. But I think there is some. They put the whole town on a train to get them out. Right. On the same train. Like they didn't pick a designated survivor. Maybe it's Patty Duke. She's the last remaining citizen. Olivia de Havilland. She has a premonition and says, I just had the feeling that I'm never going to see Marysville again. Or I'm never going to see any of my school children. Or that everyone on this train is about to die in a horrible fiery crash. Cut to the engine of the train where a couple of yahoos who are piloting this thing are having a couple of sandwiches as well as some belts of old granddad. And this bee lands on one of the dude's hands. Dale! Dale! There's a bee on my hand! What do I do, Dale? What do I do? Whatever you do, don't make it mad. All right, Dale. I'm not going, oh, you guys, come on, kill it! He smacks the bee out on the back of his hand, and the implication is that the rest of the swarm is like, wait a second, did you just smack one of our boys? What is going on with these engineers? Boys, let's sting them. What's the deal with that guy being an asshole? The swarm attacks just the engine of the train, uh -huh. which 
causes one of the engineers to fall forward onto the accelerator or whatever right making this train now rocket uh, along the rails this all sounds way more exciting than it really is you're doing a good job you're painting a picture bro thank you very much the train rocketing along the rails and it takes a turn too fast and the thing just starts flipping over the engine goes first and then the passenger cars beset by bees people are thrown out of the windows as the uh, cars turn over and over down this mountain it's like watching a six-year-old play with matchbox cars the way i described it and what really happens is the difference in like the movie ant-man between like the miniature action and the macro action where you just see a model train fall over you know it's pretty bad yeah and then all of the train cars explode into fire one by one as though they're loaded up with TNT, nitroglycerin, and cases of baked beans. Given how, how much everyone's sweating, maybe they're all drinking nitro. Maybe that's the secret. <laughs> we have actual exploding passengers. That is not how you transport nitro! Good God. Speaking of racist movies. So <laughs> let's cut back to our headquarters where they get reports that only 17 people survived the train wreck. Doesn't matter. We don't know who those 17 people were. You think for a moment it might be the oldsters, but it's not. We never see anyone from the train again. I saw on the second viewing, Felix is one of the people who gets thrown out of the window. So he's for sure dead because I've seen other movies that behave as narrative devices. You would expect like, oh, that's going to mean that something maureen and the mayor end up together but it doesn't mean nothing well they do they're just melted together end up together in eternity like blue oyster cult tells us so you get a not fear in the reaper and then slater is like oh christ what is your plan you want to drop a bunch of poison pellets into these bee swarms that's never gonna work you better hope that works i haven't done anything to find an antidote i've spent most of my time napping and watching judge judy she's a looker and richard shaverl is like well i think it will work general because i'm the one who invented those poison pellets so how about you go fuck yourself and michael kane then is like everyone shut up i have something to say you manning the computer feed this into your device a swarm of bees attacks a train 75 miles northwest of Houston. That train is moving at 60 miles an hour. At the same time, another swarm of bees has left Chicago. It is going 75 miles an hour. Now, at what point, assuming that these bees maintain velocity, will they meet? and where also everyone we have to get rid of these africans now that i've told you all that get me a revised timetable and they're like of what a timetable and 12 and then the computer and this is one of the really shocking ones where the computer screen says africans will be in houston in three days yes not african bees just africans yeah holy shit And all of the principal actors, who were old white guys, they look quite worried. (laughs) They seem very upset by this proposition. So we cut to all these military helicopters dropping environmentally friendly poison pellets to kill the bees uh, from the sky down on the ground below. But the bees don't bother to eat the poison. And what's the deal with all these poison pellets? I thought airplane food was bad, but helicopter food is the worst. When Michael Caine is reporting this back, because he's in the helicopter, because of course they're helicopters, while they're dropping this, it's as if the bees can sense it's something that will kill them. Did any of you happen to tell one of the bees that we were dropping poison? Did you tell them? You tell one bee. He tells two friends. And they tell two friends. And so on. And so on. And so on. Richard Chamberlain, did you happen to draw little skull and crossbones on all of the poison pellets? I had to do something. I didn't want Paul, that sick child. Damn it, Richard Chamberlain. Did you think? That these bees were so foolish, they would not recognize the international symbol for poison after they killed all those people on that train. Do you really want me to sit here and believe that? I would like it if if you would believe that, yes. Well, I do not. That sounds like your problem. And then Richard Chamberlain says, huh, they're brighter than we thought they were. <laughs> and Henry Fonda says, they always are. It's like, what are you talking about? What does any of this mean? (laughs) That you were outsmarted by B somehow? Is no one else horrified by this notion? (laughs) That they just looked at a thing and they were like, that's probably poison. (laughs) Back at the hospital, Dr. Martinez has birthed 
Patty Duke's baby. Also, Patty Duke, she's all sweaty in this scene. Dr. Martinez, he's, again, a real creep. And he's in love with Patty Duke, but none of that matters later on. Um, She's all high on morphine or whatever they used to give pregnant women in the 70s during childbirth. And Patty Duke says, this is the moment when... A woman falls in love with the doctor who birthed her baby. And Dr. Martina says, yes, I, I hope that you stay in love with me forever and ever and ever, Patty Duke. Could you ever love a man like me the way you used to love Gomez Adams? Please, Patty Duke, I want to make an honest woman out of you. Right, her husband is in the ground, one presumes, but certainly not long. It's shocking that this doctor is like, look, I know your husband just died, but... I saw you two together. I think you and I can both agree it wasn't going to work out. We cut over to Paul, the kid's room, and he's hooked up to machines that monitor his being alive state. Uh And Catherine Ross is there sitting bedside for some strange reason. And then Paul, the kid, flatlines and dies. Yeah. And the sexy doctor comes in to pronounce him dead. And then Michael Caine comes in and is like, what's all this? And... Catherine Ross, God bless her. I think she's a fine actress, but this is not her finest acting moment no. where she goes, Oh my God, what good is all this if we can't even save this child? What good is all this science? What good are you? Damn you, Michael Kane. Damn you. Hold me. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean all of that, Michael Kane. I love you. So they hit the road again. Uh huh. And Michael Kane barely tolerates Catherine Ross telling him all about Paul wanting to be an archaeologist or some shit. Uh-huh. And she's like, I think he would have been a good one. And he's like, uh huh, uh huh. I'm sure he would have been a good one too. Listen, I know we never got to, you know, conjugate the verb when everyone had been evacuated back at town because of, well, you know, the bees. But here we are out on the road. Everything seems to be fairly stable at the moment. Maybe we pull off and I don't know. You just lean over. Maybe just mouth stuff. No? Okay. You know what? How about hand stuff? I'm okay with it. Neither one. Okay. I read the room wrong. That's my fault. Blame that on Michael Caine. Catherine Ross says, so you didn't tell me that three of the four people that were stung by bees later died. Nope. I did not. You know, we just saw Paul, Mm -hmm. that kid who was going to grow up to be a great architect. Well, he was stung by a bee and he died. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like everybody who gets stung by one of these bees dies. No, I'm going to correct you right there. Not everyone. Do you remember that I was stung by a bee earlier Mm -hmm. when we were in the diner? Yes, that is why I have been pressing so hard on all the sex. I feel like the window is closing. And if we wanted to say stop right now and have sex, we could. We make our way back to Missile Command and General Slater's there and he says, Ah, Christ. Look, we dropped your poison pellets and the Africans just spit on it. All right, now they're moving to Houston faster than ever. Major Baker shows up and he reports, uh, three steel mills, seven oil refineries, two beet sugar plants, and a nuclear power plant, and over 40 towns are in the path of the Africans. Bees. Th- Africa. They don't even put the word bees on the end of it, Bo. <laughs> yeah. Just say African bees. Say killer bees. Yeah, or even if you said killer African bees, maybe that's a little bit better. Not uh, maybe, but not much. It's all shocking. I mean, truly, not since Stay Away Joe has my jaw dropped in a movie (laughs) because of the obvious racism. It's truly stunning. Michael Cade says, we have to evacuate the town and close the factories, shut everything down. We will work to find an antidote. And once it's available, a large portion of the population will most likely refuse to take it because they do not trust the government or feel that the threat of bees is a conspiracy that was planted by Ant Beta, the right-wing radical movement made up of ants and bees. Oh, great. I'm never going to get these nuclear power plants to shut down. I mean, uh, it's uh, Gentlemen, gentlemen, um, I used to protest nuclear power plants, so I know the, the men who run there. I could go with my neatly trimmed beard and try to jawbone some sense into these people. We fought in courts over the years. Why wouldn't they want to listen to me? Handsome Richard Chamberlain with his neatly trimmed beard. You know, your beard makes a good point. You go and talk to these nuclear people. Meanwhile, I'm going to see if Catherine Ross wants to have sex or if she's passed out dead. Either way, I'm probably going to end up having sex with her. It's only been about 45 minutes since I last saw her. She would be mm, 92, 91 degrees at worst. 
Michael Cade goes downstairs to check on Dr. Henry Fonda's progress on coming up with an antidote to this bee sting. And Dr. Henry Fonda says, "Ah, I tried it on some of these rabbits, but hell if I know if it works. This whole sequence is crazy. So Michael Caine, after chastising Henry Fonda, like, look, you need to eat. They have been scientifically designing these meals so that you can have all the energy you need to stay up here in this morgue. We need an antidote, old man. If you've gotten an antidote, how about you try it on me? And Henry Fonda is like, what? Who? You? Who are you? I'm Michael Caine. You can try the antidote on me. No, no, I'm going to have a sandwich. You come back tomorrow and we'll antidote together. All right, get, you get out of (laughs) here. We'll antidote together. So he takes off and Henry Ford is like, well, uh, let me start this recorder. Uh, That's the wrong button. Play and record at the same time. Frankly, come in here and show me how to hit record. And so he finally gets this thing going. Click, click. And he's just narrating as he's like, all right, I'm going to stick myself with this venom. It's uh, six stings. <sighs> and then I'm going to give myself one minute to get the antidote, which is what a normal person would take. I'll count off the minute all right the venom is in me here we go one mississippi two mississippi about this time normal person be feeling the sting trying to roll up their sleeve oh i got an erection oh oh jackpot jackpot oh i'm gonna make a fortune until this thing goes generic he's got the venom coursing through him and he's like all right so now 45 (laughs) seconds have passed normal person Rolls up their sleeve. I'm going to also tweet, I've been stung by bees. And a little selfie. All right. Right here. Here's the welt. All right. And I send that. Okay. That's 60 seconds. Oh, hard to move my arm. Boy, heart rate really climbing. I shouldn't have sent that tweet. And then he manages to jab himself. Does he? Yeah. I was a little confused. I couldn't tell if he got the syringe in his arm or not. He does. All and right. then he, he starts, again, just sweaty as all get out. All right, 140, 130, 120. Pulse coming back to normal. Erection sadly diminishing. Come on, girl. Get back up there. And then Catherine Ross comes in. It's like, what are you doing? I got a boner. Oh, you missed it. I was right at 6 o'clock. I went high noon for a minute. It reminded me of the old days in college. Then he starts to plummet again, like his heart rate starts to go up. And instead of, I don't know, having her inject him with more antidote to see if maybe he just didn't take enough, they're just like, oh shit, hang on, you stay here, I'll be right back. So does the antidote work or not? Because he gives it to himself and then he gets better, but then he dies. Right, that's why I'm like, double the dose, let's see what happens, maybe you just need more. Long story short, he dies. He sees a giant bee and dies, yeah. Which, again, is a thing in this movie for no discernible reason that people who have been stung see a giant bee before they kick it. Anyway, Catherine Ross returns with some oxygen and just straps a mask to him. Meanwhile, the monitor is just beep, and she's adjusting his pillow and shit. You're like, he's dead. What are you doing? And it takes other science guy, the assistant or whatever, he comes in with General Slater and Slater's like, ah, Christ, he's dead. And then Michael Caine comes back. Yeah. He's been gone for all of five minutes. (laughs) Right. I just came back in here to make him feel bad about not eating again. What's going on here? He's dead. No, not you, Dr. Henry Fonda. Good night, you prince of May, you king of New England. (laughs) Why do we fall down? Master White, so we can pick ourselves up. What's it all about, Alfie? <laughs> well done. You deserve that Oscar. <laughs> Richard Chamberlain is with Jose Ferrer. What is going on? At a nuclear power plant, which is a <laughs> weird collection of words to put together, but that's what's going on in this movie. I, I was expecting Tommy Lasorda to show up. <laughs> right. The baseball bunch <laughs> is all here. But Jose Ferrer runs this nuclear power plant. There is no way I'm turning this off. This place is completely foolproof. No, there is no way. Wait, you got, you hear something? And Richard Chamberlain is like, oh my God, the bees are here. <laughs> 
What is going on with all this nuclear energy? All this buzzing has me humming. I like that when he's talking to the head of the nuclear power plant, the guy's pitching this, that nuclear power is the best energy source ever. Like, it's clean, it's sensible, it's reasonable, it's economical, it's affordable. Nothing could possibly go wrong until a year from now when Three Mile Island happens. Three Mile Island shit the next 12 seconds of this movie. Well, that's bees. That's not... Dude, <laughs> That's not. did you miss the nuclear explosion? Well, they don't address that issue. I agree that when the nuclear plant explodes because of i don't know bo bees so here's what happens the bees break in (laughs) and kill everybody in slow motion yeah Yeah, right again it's a Zack snyder movie everybody dies in slow motion and then richard chamberlain and jose ferrer are like jeez it it's the bees and they're trying to get out of there but of course the bees get them and there's a moment where richard chamberlain is like oh my god i think they're gonna set off the kaboom fade to white and then cut to the headquarters where the ticker is like that killed an entire town called armington texas and thirty six thousand people are now vaporized that's a real death star type achilles heel you know if bees can get in and blow up a nuclear power plant you got a problem there bud that also sounds expensive and is why we didn't see more of this i'm sure in the movie <laughs> fade to white oh and thirty six thousand people died really okay i'll take your word for it movie so general slater shows up yeah christ look michael kane the president's authorized me to shut down your operation this is the military's job and i'm in charge the way he puts it chad is the president has given us the right to fight the africans it's now in the military's hands where it should have been from the start i haven't surrendered yet i'm taking this nameless scientist in our movie, and we are going to go to Houston, where the African swarm is expected in 17 hours, General. Science guy, do you have the oscilloscopes? Yes? Good. That's all we need. Good day, General. I have my, my oscilloscopes. My name's Brian. I don't I, care what your name is. You are the guy with the oscilloscopes, and that's all I care about. Is Richard Chamberlain coming back? Richard to- Chamberlain is dead. Just get that through your thick head. Him and his beautiful beard. They are Go! Just like the little boy, Paul. He has my passport. Oh, you are in a lot of trouble. (laughs) I'm going to tell you right now, there is no amount of paperwork that's going to get you out of this quickly. Then we get this sad scene where Michael Caine goes back and visits the place where Dr. Henry Fonda died just a few minutes ago in the movie. And he rubs the wheelchair handle and he picks up this dead guy's glasses. None of this should be in the movie. (laughs) No, maybe if I put on his glasses, I will know what he knew. I will be able to see his killer. Oh my god, it was the bees. <laughs> Michael Caine and Catherine Ross go on another road trip in his brown conversion van. They make their way to Houston, and over the radio we hear, 600,000 people have been evacuated. Everybody else stayed indoors or went to church, but mostly between prayers, they watched the weather. As a cold front from Alaska has kept the Africans confined to the Texas area. There's not even a mention of bees in the radio report, Bo. As they head to Houston, they go to find General Slater. So we've just relocated the headquarters here and and gotten the gang back together. Right. And then General Slater is like, ah, Christ, by tomorrow, there are going to be no more Africans in Houston. I wish all of this would end. I think you skipped over the real important part where you see them go inside the new headquarter building, get on an escalator, and slowly ascend it up to the next floor, and then they get on the elevator, push a button, we wait for the doors to close, and then they do close, which then takes them up to General Slater's new headquarter office. No one will be seated during the elevator sequence. Oh my god. It takes its time. It's a measured pace, I think is what they call it. Or just crap, I think is the other word for it. And so they get to Slater, and Michael Caine says, So, what is your big plan, General? And he says, Well, I'll tell you, what we're going to do is we're going to get all these bees in one area, and we're going to zap them. We're going to hit them with something called Nutricide. It's made out of vibranium. What? Nutricide? Are you mad, General? I'm in charge here, all right? Get those whirly birds up in the air. And then we see footage of, I think, planes this time. Some stock footage. Vietnam footage, I'm sure, uh, is what it looks like. 
spraying nutricide and immediately the bees are not impacted at all by the poison michael kane takes the victory lap on that one too well that's just what i was afraid of that they had become immune to all pesticides not just nutricide and it's like well all right yes you're the smartest person alive what do you want you want a trophy we're all gonna die does that make you happy and then a bunch of air raid sirens start going off it looks like nothing's gonna stop these bees Bo. and we get a new news reporter who comes on this jumbotron and states with the approval of the president the city of houston will suffer massive man-made burning before daybreak to destroy the african killer bees this will be accomplished using flamethrowers in a matter of minutes oh my and god i'm Chad. like you had me at flamethrowers the swarm light them up boys they do it's just a bunch of lunatics with flamethrowers setting fire to everything. It's one of the greatest things ever captured in film. There are 10 stuntmen in flame retardant, I hope, suits just spraying fire from flamethrowers all over the streets of this backlot set. It's like watching 10 Ghostbusters fire proton packs at once. It's pretty good. It's about as good as the movie gets. But this had to be one of the greatest days of these stuntmen's lives. Like, could you just imagine how awesome that would be? Shoulder to shoulder, just indiscriminately blasting fire towards cars or trucks that are marked with big red letters that say flammable on the side. And it is indiscriminate. It's as if the, these stunt people were given no direction at all other than, I don't know, you've got a flamethrower. Of of course they weren't it's like they gave it to you and me <laughs> it's quite you know, it's good. like you ever used a pressure washer imagine if a pressure washer shot fire that's exactly what's going on because it's kind of like brrr, whoa that's got a little kick brrr. let's see what this baby's got brrr. i'm pretty sure that's how they invented the flamethrower as someone said what if a pressure washer but fire what if a pressure washer but bees <laughs> oh now we're talking <laughs> the dogs who chew bees at you had to be at least referenced once <laughs> then we cut to michael kane and Catherine ross where michael kane is waxing all poetic about like can you imagine a world where we as a species are submissive to the bees they have taken over and no one would have suspected it because they were always our friends the bees it's hysterical man again this is a movie that michael kane did for a house for his mom he was upfront about that is that the speech where Catherine ross has given him the back rub and then she kathunks passes out it is the one and the same all right where as he's musing about this she comes over and starts rubbing his shoulders and he says oh that's better than eight hours of sleep and she says you wouldn't know you haven't had eight hours of sleep since you started this old mess oh there goes the day <sighs> You know, Catherine Ross, rubbing my shoulders is better than eight hours of sleep. But you know what I could use? Something better than ten hours sleep. Have you ever thought of massaging not only shoulders, but pelvises? Because I have, thanks to Dr. Henry Fonda's antidote, a rather fierce erection. I injected it directly into the base, and it has been much longer than four hours. She just falls on the ground, kathunk. And I was like, oh, she's dead, because everybody else who died from bee stings ended the same way. The thought that she passes out in the middle of that he's having is actually, if only there was some kind of bee sound that would make them all go to the same place. And then she passes out because she's got, you know, beatus and whatnot. We cut back to our knuckleheads with the flamethrowers and an ambulance is cruising through the town, but it gets attacked by bees and then crashes through a storefront and just explodes. Bo, it explodes four times, <laughs> shot by four different cameras, and yeah. we see them all. Absolutely. General Slater and Bradford Dillman bust in on michael kane who is with Catherine ross and they don't come into the room they just open the door and they're kind of spying on him dear god whose name i do not know thank you for this day but mostly will you save Catherine ross we have not had sex yet and i would very much like to before she dies she did not deserve to be in this movie her career was going so good with the graduate and butch cassidy to her credit please let her go on to better movies than this film the swarm she was really on the upswing with the Stepford Wives. It's quite abiding satire. I hope sometime in the future she can appear in a movie like Donnie Darko and really redeem herself. Also, I'd like her to come too to take care of this raging antidote boner that I cannot get to go down in my pants. Antidote boner will be the name of my band if we make it through this. 
but for now, it is just the rather painful erection that I'm carrying around in my pants. <laughs> Bradbury Tillman says, look at this asshole. I don't know that if we should trust the scientist who prays. And General Slater says, oh, Christ, I, w- I wouldn't trust a scientist who didn't. Also, forget about that dossier that I forgot about already. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we cut to a nightmare on B Street where <laughs> Catherine Ross wakes up from her bed, hears something scratching at the door, and opens it to find a giant bee. And then she screams and passes out. But I guess that's how she healed because then she's okay for the rest of the movie. I don't know. Anyway, back to the flamethrowers. And yes. then maybe the bees blow up a truck and then they start to get the flamethrower guy somehow. And I'm not sure. I thought that the flamethrower guys just passed out from sheer elation (laughs) and joy. I mean, just spinning in circles and spraying fire into the air. That's it. That's the moment that you die. Doctor, it it seems that his lower extremities are soaked with semen. Actually, he passed out from sheer dehydration. He was ejaculating from what can only be described as pure joy. That uh, a kind of joy that uh, I've never known. And it was a sustained period of it. Much like those rats that'll just keep going after the heroin instead of food. That's kind of what he was doing. Uh, His body just couldn't stand it. Based on the coroner's report, he had, let me double check this, a two and a half hour orgasm. Slater (laughs) is up with Michael Caine in this high rise headquarter, just looking down over the city and admitting defeat. Ah, Christ. They gonna blame me for this shit. Michael Caine says, you know, General, you add my compliments. <laughs> Christ, what, what for? And he says, well, you have a long-term view of history that I think is very important. Well, that's the only kind of view you can have right now because of how tits up this all went. Hey, you got any of them sunflower seeds? I've given up on everything, including being a man and not eating sunflower seeds. General, let me let you in on a little bit of secret. These aren't sunflower seeds. It's crack cocaine. I put a little bit on my tongue, and I let it dissolve throughout the day. I gotta be honest, I haven't slept in almost a month and a half. Ever since this bee thing started. You know, I told you I'd been tracking the bees all night before I got to you that installation. I hadn't slept for two weeks prior to that point. <laughs> And since then, I certainly haven't. Both the elation of finding bees that I had predicted for years and years, and also the massive amounts of crack cocaine that I, Michael Caine, <laughs> am eating like Pop Rocks. No apologies for the raging erection in my pants. That is what I have now trademarked as an antidote boner. If you would like one, or alternately, would like to take care of this one, either of those things can be arranged. Honestly, if you have an antidote boner, I'm willing to do the same for you. (laughs) And Chad, let me give you an actual piece of dialogue from this movie, or an actual exchange. (laughs) After, After Slater's all but given up, Michael Caine says to him, We have one more experiment to try, General. Please don't give up. The General says, Okay. Michael Caine says, Thank you. And then leaves. We have one more experiment to try, General. Please don't give up. Okay. Thank you. That's the exchange. In fairness to the general, if you look out the window, you basically have four remaining maniacs with flamethrowers and a building surrounded by bees. So Michael Caine, in very quick order, figures out that, hey, that siren sound from the missile base at the beginning of the movie is what uh, initially lured the bees there. Yes. Unfortunately, this discovery came at a bad time because the bees have just taken the elevator up, which is true. (laughs) The elevator doors open up. Ding! What is the deal with no 13th floor? I mean, the 14th floor is just the 13th floor, am I right? Here we are, 18th floor, headquarters, and bee stings. So the doors open up and out spills a couple of flamethrower guys with the bees hot on their heels. That had to be an awkward ride up. (laughs) So you guys are going to kill us when we get up there. I got to tell you, we're looking forward to it. Could you give me a like a three step head start i'll tell you what we'll do you one better we'll let you get the flamethrower lit (laughs) they bust out into the floor everything goes crazy one guy on fire jumps out the window which is pretty good (laughs) there's a lot of practical stuntman nonsense going on in this finale it's awesome it's pure mass hysteria if you were gonna watch anything in the movie like watch this 15 minute run 
Yeah, the last 20 minutes is worth your time. Mm, I mean, up until... 15 minutes yeah. is worth your time. You want to leave before the end, because the end is shit. Bradford Dillman busts in and, and says, Hey, the bees broke into the building. He says that. Yeah. He says, General, the bees have broken inside. Yeah. I was so happy that he didn't say the Africans have broken inside. He's about as woke as you get in this movie. General Slater is like, All right, Michael Caine, you and your science friend go off and save the day <laughs> i'll shoot a flamethrower at the bees looks like a lot of fun from the 18th floor all right but first i'm gonna stop off and save Catherine ross because i have not closed the door on the whole sex idea with her so he does he goes to her place and she is up and about now because again she had her fever dream about the bee and is now okay i guess I mean, you know what power of prayer bo i get kept it. her alive joel olstein was right he, she's starting to get dressed and he just goes no no time here let me put this blanket on you and let's go which i like because he seems like the kind of guy like when you're like what are we gonna eat tonight we're gonna go have indian and you're like i don't know if i'm in the mood no we're gonna have indian we're not gonna let this turn into 20 minutes of what are we gonna go eat it's indian so let's go i like when he wraps her in the blanket and they run into the hallways bees are everywhere yes okay but the bees don't sting michael kane or Catherine ross it's real perplexing as to who they go after and who they don't yes well i think they recognize that he's a friend to them <laughs> Because he's the secret bad guy. Sure enough, General Slater and the science pal are trying to hold off the bees. They basically buy time for Catherine Ross and Michael Caine to get to a helicopter, naturally. <laughs> Where Catherine Ross plays audience surrogate for two seconds and is like, Hey, if we play this bee sound that you came up with, won't the helicopter noises just drown it out and it doesn't matter? No. It happens on a totally different frequency, and shut up. Did we mention that General Slater died from bees back at the headquarters? Because yeah. he died. Yeah, he and the science buddy both get got by the bees. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, because there's like, ah! and bees just swarm all over them. Unlike every other person that like gets attacked by a bees, and then kind of swats at them for a little while, and then flops around, Richard Widmark didn't have any of that shit. He goes from, ah, here's a flamethrower for you fucking bees. Yeah, Christ, the bees he's got me shit it's a real ick and then he falls over it's pretty funny so the helicopter is taken off and they're playing the sound uh of, of that alarm <laughs> i love the smell of honey in the morning it smells like i don't know bees we do hear over the military radio attention all oil tankers spread your oil all over the gulf of mexico wait what yeah dump all of your oil where make it a real deep water horizon just dump that shit over the side of any boat you have oil rigs we're just poking holes in all of them michael Caine and elizabeth ross they're in this helicopter with these external speakers and then other helicopters show up and they start dropping something called sound floats which are tiny little rafts about four feet by four feet that have speakers on top of them and they will all be emitting the alarm sound as well to pied piper these bees out into the oil covered gulf of mexico sure enough the swarm you know hears this rocking tune and goes to investigate what's the deal with this sound i it sounds like a couple of queens fighting and i'm in the mood for a bee fight am i right fellas let's go they head you know to the speakers and as soon as they all descend on them michael Kane uh -huh. is like all right everybody shoot them with as many missiles as you got and they just blow them up they just blow up the bees. And the sky is full of orange and red fire mixed with toxic black smoke. Against the backdrop of this hellish landscape, Catherine Ross says, did we win or did we just buy ourselves time? And Michael Caine says, well, I don't know, but we have to use this time wisely. So maybe we can't avoid the Africans from taking over. And she's like, whoa, wait a second. Who did I get in bed with? What is this about Africans? I think it's time you and I had a talk. I think it is too. I think we're going to do it over Zoom. So then these two just sort of side hug and they watch the Gulf of Mexico burn. As they stop one environmental disaster with a much worse environmental disaster. And then we fade out and the movie gives us a nice thank you to the U.S. military for helping make this movie. And also American bees. Wink, wink. The end credits music is real peppy and upbeat. Well, because they won. Oh, huh. 
<laughs> yeah, and that's it. That's the swarm. All two hours and thirty five minutes of it. It's crazy how long this movie is. It feels like it's five hours long. I didn't even finish it in one sitting. The first go through, yeah, I got about half. I got up to the train crash and I turned it off and came back like a week and a half later. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's why I bought it. I, when I saw the runtime, two and a half hours. Nope. And it's two and a half long hours too. <laughs> It's not like, you know, Empire Strikes Back or something or no. Midsummer where it's like filled with wonderful imagery and Right. It's not the Godfather. It's not yeah. scent of a woman. Right. This is awful. It's a terrible, terrible movie. And and as we said, it's almost striking for how out of time it looks, considering, you know, Empire Strikes Back was coming out two years later. It's Superman. Yeah. It was yeah, the right. same year. I'm yeah. Just, yeah, it's crazy. Like we talked about in the intro, like time truly passed Erwin Allen by, and this this feels like an artifact of a bygone era of Hollywood, even at the time it came out. It's terrible. I saw it a bunch when I was a kid, though. That Henry Fonda scene, I remember uh, vividly from my youth. It's 14 minutes long. It's hard not to remember. <laughs> Seven, Mississippi! <laughs> I grew up to that scene, and I only watched it once. Yes, it's it's a bad movie but it, it's filled with good actors and i do like michael kane i am an unrepentant michael kane fan and he's very funny he's overacting his ass off in this movie because nobody cares in front of or behind the camera on this one so he's at least seemingly having a good time with it so bo we've seen movies that are like jaws but with a bear and with an alligator and now with bees but up next bo i'm taking you down to the amazon rainforest to experience a movie that's like jaws but with a snake oh no that's right bo we're talking about 1997's all-star field cast for the movie anaconda which features ben affleck's current girlfriend angelina jolie's dad luke wilson's brother and that guy who was marty mcfly who got fired because he was terrible in the role and they gave the job to michael j fox thankfully and plus one of the founding members of nwa this movie is fantastic. It is an absolute delight. I saw this movie in the theater, and even then, I knew it was just a terrible mess. I can't wait to discuss it with you in two weeks' time. I'm also excited to talk about Anaconda, mostly because it's much, much shorter than The Swarm. I find that we give extra credit points if your movie is short. If you're under 90 minutes, you're probably going to be the best film of this season. It sure stands fighting chance. And it is interesting, I think, this season so far, that the two low-budget independent movies that we saw, namely Grizzly and Alligator, are far and away the best movies when compared to a genuine big budget hollywood movie like the swarm and kind of anaconda yeah we got a lot to talk about so come back and see us in two weeks time as we present to you episode four in this season's theme it's like jaws bo any final thoughts on this particular film the swarm aka how racist can you be not so much about the swarm chad because i think we've buzzed about that enough uh -huh. you know what i'm saying but uh, i would like to say to the folks listening thank you so much for doing so and also you know we always tell you to like and review and all that stuff and that stuff is important but i'll tell you what folks can do that's super helpful is on every podcast uh, app that i know of there is a share button so if you've enjoyed this episode just share it to your timeline or your feed or whatever like people are much more likely to listen to you good listener than us about uh what they ought to be listening listening to so that's right you're smart you know what's good yeah and that's us but if we tell people that we're good we sound like assholes but if you tell people we're good then you're the one who sounds like the asshole i'm very excited now that we have uh, sort of broken the michael kane seal i hope to have more michael kane in our lives in the future there's a good chance he's not going to show up this season again but he'll be back how could he not right he's done every movie it, it's shocking that we haven't talked about him until now we could do a whole season about people having sex with underage children you know what that's a bad idea yeah that's there's a jeffrey epstein joke in there but there's just no way i'm going diving for it you know what we should stop while we're ahead come back and see us in two weeks time as we talk about anaconda the killer snake movie with j-lo and ice cube and eric stoltz and owen wilson and the guy who was the butler on richie rich and 
Who am I leaving out? Kari Wurr is in it. Yeah, that's right.